If you go on vacation and then see a crime of opportunity and you murder somebody else. There's so many cases like that. This person isn't from South America. How much of an investigation can they do in South America about what's going on here? And a lot of times the local police, they don't want to make a big deal out of it anyway. They don't want to scare off tourists and make it seem like murders happen here. I've always wanted to be in film and TV. I saw the script a couple of years out of college. It was called Just Friends. And uh, it was a romantic comedy movie that wound up getting made. And it stars uh, Ryan Reynolds and Anna Faris and Amy Smart. Uh, it doesn't really have any crime in it. The, the, the crime is of the heart uh, where he <laughs> wants to date the girl. And she just wants to be friends and uh, trying to overcome that. And our big thing was we, we sold a show called Brain Games to National Geographic Channel. And that was all about neuroscience and how your brain works. And, uh, you know, the tricks it plays, like why optical illusions work and why magic works. Uh, and actually, we worked with a guy named Apollo Robbins, who you may may have heard of. But his big thing was he, he was the world's preeminent, like, pickpocket. Okay. Um, so he could, like, steal the stuff right off your, you know, glasses right off your face and be wearing them. And you wouldn't, and you wouldn't notice it. And uh, he had a great line. He would say, they don't pay me to steal stuff. They pay me to give it back. When the pandemic came, uh, we couldn't make TV, so we got microphones and we started podcasting, and we do a kids' educational podcast uh, called Who Smarted, which uh, has blown up to become one of the top kids' educational podcasts, but you don't make a lot of money doing kids' educational podcasts, so we were like, what else can we do? And I love crime uh, movies. Uh, you know, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, Man Bites Dog, a lot of, a lot of cool crime and serial killer type stuff. And as it turns out, my wife, Kim, is also a huge crime buff. Yeah, women are, are something like, is it 65 or 70 percent of the consumers of violent, uh, violent yeah. through crime? Because wow. it, it's funny that, I mean, this just might interest you real quick, is that my channel, which I almost never do anything on violent crime. So most of my stuff is like credit card fraud, bank, you know, bank robberies, uh, maybe bank fraud right. on men, but or you know even uh, drug cases that it that my consume the people that consume that based on the analytics it's like 93 94% male. Right. So right. but it but violent crime like serial killers, murders, it's like that, it's women. Yeah. It's, I, it's, it's I don't weird. know what it is. I, I, I know one of the things, you know, we talk about is um, women love to play detective. Like even my wife, like she says she missed her true calling as a forensics or as crime scene investigator. Like that wasn't that big back when she was like figuring out what to do. Um, she did work for many years as a social worker in domestic violence shelter. So she did get to see, you know, some real dark stuff. And even as bad as like the batterers were to the women, the women were also really bad at like turning on each other in the shelter and snitching on each other to get somebody kicked out. And so, yeah, she was around a lot of, you know, dark, dark stuff uh, there, but she's always had a true crime at heart. Um, you know, uh, that that's always been her thing. I am good at coming up with names of crime shows and I had seen a, a case where two people had gone on vacation and uh, one person wound up drowning in a kayak accident. And I was like, oh, wow, that's like a slaycation. Because they, they weren't sure, did, did, she call, you know, did she tamper with the boat? Was it sabotage or did, was it an accident? And I said, oh, it sounds like a slaycation. And we were like, oh, that title is pretty good. Let's do that. So it's basically slaycation is a new podcast that we're launching January 9th. Uh, it, it stars me. My wife, the true crime nut, and my business partner Jerry. Uh, and Jerry has had, um, you know, some success in the true crime space. He's a, you know, obviously a TV producer as well. And we were at a company called Jupiter Entertainment, and they had the first season of of a show called Homicide Hunter, with Sergeant, uh, J you know, Joe Kenda. And it was, you know, murder cases that he had overseen while he was in Colorado, and he had like a huge like success rate, like solved. 90 something percent of his cases. So the first season hadn't done that well. So Jerry, uh, he brought in a new showrunner and together they rebooted 
Homicide Hunter, and it blew up. It became one of the most successful true crime shows of all time. Um, so we have a little bit of true crime cred. Uh, and then, you know, the format of our show is my wife, Kim, and Jerry do the research on the cases. And I deliberately don't know what's coming. So they tell me the story, and then I can ask questions and make jokes and comments and, um, you know, learn about it in real time, almost like I'm a proxy for the listener. Right. So, you know, it's a, fun, uh, it's a fun setup, and the cases are great. It kind of like uh, my favorite murder. A little bit. I think we try not to like they really. I mean, we love that show, but yeah. they really are over the top. We love murder. Yeah, like, yeah, they, yeah, they. <laughs> That's their space. That's their lane. Uh, you know, we do comment like these things are fucked up, but also like the, you know, I'm a I'm a film guy, you know, so I like a twisty turny story, and. I know we have a good case when I'm like, I, I think she did it. Oh, wait, I don't think she did it. Maybe that was an accident. Oh, wait, no, no, no. Now I'm back on. She did it. Wait, no, nah, nah, I'm not sure. And, you know, these cases, because the evidence, you know, it's like they find a, a, a tampered apparatus. Okay, it seems cut and dry. Then an expert comes out and says, actually, that, that you don't need that for the, the, the kayak to function properly. You know, like a, a thing had been removed, a plug. Oh, and the plug was found in her car. She must be the murderer. No, actually, they had taken the plug out months ago. Their cat played with it as a toy, and the, the kayak doesn't need the plug to you know keep from uh, submerging. So uh, was it murder or was it an accident? You listen to the 911 call, and we're trying to decide what, were, they, were they a good enough actor to get away with it or not? Um, and that's a pro tip. I always say, if you're going to murder somebody, take some acting lessons because uh, you're going to have to do some acting. I always hate that, by, by the way, when they hear the 911 tape and they're like, oh, they were over the top or no, they were too calm yeah. or like you don't know how you're going to react. Cool. You know what I'm saying? Cool. They, I interviewed a guy. Um, I interviewed a guy who was found guilty of his wife's murder. And then they came to find out that it was her best friend who murdered her. And they were upset because when he called 911, he said she had killed herself. Right. But the problem was when he went in, all he saw was blood on her and her laying down. And they, he didn't realize like she'd been stabbed, whatever, 20 something, mm -hmm. 30 times, you know, in, in the, like basically in the neck area, like what all he saw was she was laying in a, in a pool of blood. She right. had cancer. She had tried to, um, she had, I think she uh, uh, made attempts on suicide before. So, you know, he didn't think that. And suddenly it became, oh, he did it. He was trying to cover it up by saying she committed suicide. But obviously, once we got there, we realized it wasn't so that he lied. Right. Therefore, he must have done it. It was like, it's just in a panic. You know, sure. and then other, pe other people, you find out somebody did brutally kill their spouse or something. They came in and they were very calm. Right. My wife was found dead or my husband was found dead he was shot in the head and they use that against you they, they're like his demeanor right. doesn't yeah we, right. well, we, we get into that a lot yeah we, we do get into that a lot especially yeah um you know how how you acted you know even in the police station like you're waiting to be interrogated and they're they got the camera on you and the person gets up and starts doing some stretches or something because they've been sitting for hours and it's like look 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 how calm they are look they're doing they're doing jumping jacks they must be the murderer it's like what yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty uh, crazy. Um, you know, it's funny. We actually did work on a um, a true crime uh, podcast. Oh, no, actually, it was it was more like a little video series for Facebook, starring Amanda Knox, um, who obviously in Italy uh, was yeah. accused of killing her roommate. And she, same thing. We bring it up all the time because the way she acted in the police station didn't uh, didn't jive with the way they thought somebody should act if they were truly innocent. And right. So much of her life was 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 messed up because of a stupid, you know, behind the scenes videotape of her at a police station. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, um, it's ridiculous. Yeah, everybody reacts different. Yeah. Um, so, so how how at what point did you decide that you wanted to do this? Like, have you always, you know, were your was was your family involved in uh, TV or, you know, like? Or did we raised in Hollywood? Now, you know, family members were involved or no? But, no, you uh, know what it is? I've always been a storyteller. 
Like, okay. I love telling stories. Like, if five of us go out, it's like, you tell the story. You yeah. know, you're going to have the best way of telling the story, add the jokes, add the, you know, uh, the embellishments when necessary. Uh, and, yeah, you'll make the story good. So I've always had that storyteller at heart. And then, uh, yeah, I saw the movie Jaws when I was a kid. And I was like, yeah, I want to make movies uh, preferably about sharks, but they don't have to all be about sharks. But I love the idea of, like, because that was supposed to be a stupid movie, right? It's like a shark is killing people. Okay, we've seen lots of creature movies. But then you're like, whoa, this is a great movie, you know? And so much of it, you know, it's so funny, too, that people, if you ask them, let's say, about Jaws, you know, oh, it's a, it's about a shark. But the truth is, there's very little shark scenes. There's very, yeah. very little of that. It's like Rocky. If you ask somebody, oh, yeah, it's a boxing movie. Really? Because there's yeah. like maybe five or ten minutes of boxing. It's right. really more like a love story. It's, you it's know. a character movie. It's, yeah. a, it's a great character movie. And, yeah, and so – in fact, it was funny. I said to my wife, "If we had a if we had a boy, we were going to name it Quint." But uh, luckily, we had a girl. <laughs> so, um, but the thing is, yeah. So I I, I had the film bug. Uh, grabbed the camera. My friends, we would make movies all the time. I was fortunate enough to get into NYU film school. Uh, made movies. Um, my roommate at film school uh, was a guy named uh, Todd Phillips, who went on to huge. And, you know, obviously uh, Joker and Hangover movies and stuff. Um, and uh, actually, I have a funny story that. Uh, so one of the things uh, Todd worked on in, in at film school was a movie called Hated. Uh, and it was about a punk rocker named Gigi Allen, uh, who was like the most hardcore punk rocker of all time. He would shit on the stage. Uh, he would take off all his clothes. He'd smear the crap all over his face. He would attack the audience. He'd smash his teeth out with a microphone. He'd smash the audience teeth out with the microphone. This guy was completely out of control. His concerts, quote unquote concerts, rarely lasted more than three or four songs. The police were often called and either he was getting arrested or he had to flee out the back door and somehow was able to get a cab uh, naked and covered in piss and, and, and shit and blood. Anyway, the point is, Gigi... Uh, was a big fan of the serial killer John Wayne Gacy. And they would go visit John Wayne Gacy in prison. So when we were making this movie, we thought, oh, maybe we should get John Wayne Gacy, who was painting in prison. We'll get him to paint a portrait of Gigi, and that'll be our poster art. So it's like, how do we get a hold of it? Well, you know, through the, you know, Gigi and his punk rock connections, uh, we were able to get word to John Wayne Gacy. And of course, Gacy is like, uh, if you send me a picture of the director with no shirt on, I'll consider it. So <laughs> we're up on the roof taking pictures of Todd. Like, how do I pose for this? How do I pose for a serial killer's approval to paint a painting? Yeah. So we take the pictures. We send it to Gacy. Gacy approves. He paints the painting. They smuggle it out. We turn it into a poster. And uh, it's the poster for the movie. However, what we didn't know is, uh, or didn't count on, was you know, Gacy got our phone number and would call us, collect at the apartment constantly, constantly. And uh, it was like always a collect call. We're two broke college kids. Collect call from the Indiana State Penitentiary. Will you accept the charges? Oh. And my friends are like, who's that? I'm like, it's John Casey. And they're like, what? Put him on. Put him on speakerphone. So I'd put him on and, you know, he just would have the most darkest sexual laden conversation. He was, you know, obviously crazy. And then one year, this shows up, and it's a, Christmas, it's a Christmas card from John Gacy. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, you're on his Christmas <laughs> list. Uh, so, anyway, uh, that was a diversion. But uh, back, in, yeah, back in film school, I met Jerry, um, and we had sort of parallel paths, uh, Jerry Colbert. He was doing more, um, actually, theater in college and then got more into television. I was more film. So we had these sort of parallel paths where he was show running and I was writing movies. Uh, like I said, I, I was fortunate. I was able to sell a couple of things. I started getting hired to do rewrites on things. Um, and then our paths crossed about, I don't know, 10 years, like, you know, early 2008, I'd say, or 2008, 2009, somewhere around there. It was a writer's strike. I was out of work. Uh, the deals I had all fell apart. So I was able to get into TV with Jerry. We worked on something together. 
and um, we had a great time collaborating. Uh, he had hired me for something, and um, and then we yeah we, we did the show Brain Games, and that got Emmy nominated. It became National Geographic's high, highest rated show. Oh yeah, um, it's, it's huge. I, I mean, I I can like it's funny how many of the shows that you've mentioned that I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that, or I, you know, oh, I've heard cool. that. I've watched. I've like I've watched a, an episode where they were um, on Brain Games where they were showing. Uh, it was something where they were turning things where it looked like one thing and then you yeah. turn it and suddenly it became something else. You're yeah. like, Oh, that's not a face at all. Right. You know, yeah, so, it, or, or that is a face. Well, it, it flips. It's like, it's concave and then you turn it and then it's suddenly convex or whatever. And like your brain just makes that, uh, yeah. Makes yeah, that leap flip for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was, that was a lot of fun. We did five seasons and 50 something episodes of that show. Uh, like I said, it was Emmy nominated. So we, we started our company based on the, on the success of that show. And then we did a couple of things, including a show called Brain Child, which was like, hey, you know, the thing with Brain Games was it was it was made for adults, right? It was National Geographic Channel. It aired at like 10 o'clock on a Monday. But we knew a ton of kids were watching. They, they were fascinated by this. And our audience was way younger than the typical Nat Geo audience. Like the, I think the average Nat Geo viewer was like 67 years old. The average Brain Games viewer was like late 30s. So it was like a tremendous drop and we knew tons of kids were interested in this. So when we stopped doing brain games, we did a show called brain child for Netflix and we did a season of that 13 episodes and we expanded beyond just the brain to like talk about all kinds of things like space and the ocean, uh, emotions and stuff like that. So that, uh, we just got data like that's in the top 15% of all Netflix shows, uh, still. Uh, today, e even though we came out in 2018 or something. So kids are still watching the hell out of that. So that was sort of our entertainment slash educational, you know, journey. And then, uh, yeah, then we got into podcasting, like I said, um, with Boost Marted. But Slaycation is a chance for us to be on mic, be ourselves, be funny, but also get into these dark cases. And like I said, the, the cases on Slaycation are so twisty and turny. And people, you know, Criminals, you, you know, they, they make the, they, they're brilliant in so many aspects and then they make a colossal error that how how could they do that? Yeah. You know, so for, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, there was a guy, he, he 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 pushed his wife off a cliff and made it seem like an accident and he would have gotten away with it, except he had a map in his car of an ex on the remote spot where she, where she was found. And. It's like, yeah. wait, what? Complete, yeah. Just no. I, listen, I I have some friends that are brilliant, and then they were caught. Just they, they would do the dumbest things. But before before I mention that, I want to say one. I like your Salvador Dali clock. Oh, thank you. Um, and uh, uh, the well, and then I was going to ask, like, what are some of your favorite uh, um episodes or cases? Sure. Uh, but what I was going to also wanted to mention is. I have a friend that would hit his, he had a, a, a quick version of his crime is that, you know, he was able to make fake IDs. Right. So, so he's got a guy that makes fake IDs. He's big on putting people together. So one, that's a problem because you're involving lots of people in your, in your crimes, but whatever. The point is he can, he's got somebody who can make fake IDs. So he ends up, he ends up getting, connected with a guy that worked in the fraud department for bank of america he tells them about something that's been happening and he's like and it happens at banks everywhere and there's really nothing we can do about it even though we know there's a fraud being committed there's just nothing we can do it's just the cost of doing business right. and that is that take take yourself for example you've got thirteen thousand dollars in your bank account you go and you send your your debit card to somebody in another state you tell them to go into, let's say the post office and tell them, go buy $9,000 worth of money orders. So right. they do. Or even if you went to a, a car, a store and went and bought something for nine grand, you go and you do it. And then for, uh, you know, whatever, 45 minutes later, you walk into the, the bank and I say, my money's gone. My money's gone. Yeah. So by law, uh, the ele electronic transfer act, they have to put the money back. Right. Now they can investigate it. And if right. they investigate and they find out that it was that you were involved, then they can reverse the charges. Right. Well, here's here's what's interesting about that is 
this guy was like, so the, the bank employee tells me this and he said, now, I don't know what you can do with this, but I feel like you're the kind of guy that could do something with it. I'm just letting know, you know, this is the thing. No bank investigates any, any of these crimes under $10,000. So if you take eight or 9,000, they, they'll, the worst they will do is close your account. Right. So what he did was he was like, okay. So he went and he thought, if I have guys, if I give people fake IDs and have them go open bank accounts in other states, right? And each person can open about three accounts before the the fourth bank they start asking questions like, "Hey, you've opened three other accounts in the last two days, or whatever." <laughs> so he said, "If so, if each guy puts about ten thousand dollars in the account, I remove ninety five hundred or nine thousand. They go in and twenty minutes later, or five minutes later, and ask for some cash, right. and have the bank tell them you don't have any money. You've got like." $200. Right. What do you mean you want 9,000 you 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 want $500? You What are you talking about? I got over $10,000 and they're it's like what you in, in another state that I couldn't possibly be in. So how, Right. Uh, right. So and he, and he said my problem with that was where do I find these people? Like who's going to do that? Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, yeah. So I well, where did you find him? He said first appearance. Now he'd been arrested over and over again. So he said I went to the courthouse and when people get arrested and they go for their first appearance, typically the prosecutor stands up and says, your honor, we're not giving this guy any bond or we're giving him $5,000 in bond. He's been arrested twice for credit card fraud. He's been arrested for um, check fraud. He's been arrested for telecommunications fraud. And he goes, they basically read their resume. Right. He said, he goes, so I would sit there for two hours and I would end up with five people's names. He said, I, he said if they didn't get bond, I would write them a letter, Mm -hmm. money on their books and say, Hey, call me. I'm going to bond you out of jail. He would, they would call him on a phone that is a burner phone and he'd explain the scam to them over the phone and say, now, if you're interested, I will bond you out. He would, they, of course, these are career criminals. They're like, yeah, just bond bond me out. So he said, you know, if you bonded out like four guys, he's and typically their bonds are 500 bucks, a thousand. I'm going to give them 10% down. It's nothing, you know, it's $5,000 bond. He's like, but they're broke because most of them are drug addicts. Um, so he said, I would bond them out. And when they would go to get their property, they would, he would have his wife go and put a phone in their property. Cause when you, the, the, where your property is held, you can go there and say, Hey, John Smith is about to be bonded out. I'm his wife or I'm a friend of his. He doesn't have a cell phone. Can you put this in with his property? And they were, they would always go, yeah, of course. They put it in the bag. And so when he got it, he would get a, the phone. He'd call the number. Right. They'd say, take a photo of yourself, send it to me. They'd send it to him. They would then send him, send him the IDs, a plane ticket. He'd go open the accounts, wait a couple of days, get the debit cards, scan them, send the duplicate deb- debit cards back to Florida. They would go take the money out of the account and then he, they'd go back and the guy would go back in the bank and he was sending two or three people every single month doing this. So he's making no, the, the scam was netting two, 300,000 a month. He's giving the guys 30%. And he said they were always good for a trip or two and then they get back on drugs or they get rearrested. But I always thought it was brilliant. And the way yeah. his whole kind of scam unraveled was this. One day, he and his wife, ba- basically, it's a little bit more complicated. But this was one of the stupid things that he did right. that got them onto his trail. He and his wife were on vacation, and right. they used a stolen credit card to buy their hotel room for a week. And I'm like, you've got half a million dollars in the bank. You've got 100000 something dollars in cash. Why would you use a st- stolen credit card? And he goes, well, why would I pay for it when I have a stolen credit card? I'm like, because... This is you. Why would you take that risk? Why would you? He's like, well, I just. And that got him caught? Eventually, that's one of the things that led to his. Right, right. Yeah, there's, well, there's multiple things that ended up, you know, converging. But that's one of them. And that's, but that's the kind of things that he would do. That's such a cell phone. That's such a, like, you, I'd expect it to be one of these knuckleheads that he hires, somebody. Yeah. Yeah, it was. No, it, he owned it himself. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Um, and that's what always tends to get these guys that I, I would meet, it would be like one little thing. It's like, why'd you do that? Why did you just give the person the money back? Like I have a guy whose whole Ponzi scheme came undone because of like a, a hundred thousand dollars that suddenly he took from somebody and their daughter started freaking out and said, they started saying they were going to call the police. They're going to call the FBI. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. Something's wrong. I don't think something's wrong about something's wrong about your financial Ponzi mm-hmm. scheme. 
And instead of him saying, listen, I'm just going to give you the money back. He, he, he didn't, I go, why didn't you? And he goes, you know, I mean, she was being such a jerk about it. I'm like, you'd stole $50 million. Right. It's a hundred grand. Well, he's like, I know, but you made me so mad. And it was just like, what do you think? These guys do stupid things. Yeah. Oh, I, I got a scam for you. You, you, okay. you are the perfect guy. You guys, uh, you're the guy that would that appreciate this the most. Um, so back when we were in college, uh, like I said, Todd and I lived together. It was like freshman year was like 89, 90. We had a guy. He was the brother of uh, there's this Russian girl that we knew at school. Her older brother was like a high roller guy show up and then the fancy car and the fancy clothes. And we're like, what does he do? He basically tells us, this is what I'm doing. And I want you guys, if you guys want to be in. This was the day, early days of like the, the 1-800 numbers. Call 1-800, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And you could set up those numbers to cost whatever you want, to charge whatever you want per minute. If you, you know, uh, it's like, you know, phone sex, uh, only $1.99 a minute or whatever. But you could make it $100 a minute, $99 a minute. Of course, no one's going to want to pay that. So no one would ever call that number. But what you can do is you set it up to be $99 a minute. Like your first minute is whatever, and then every other minute is $99. Then he would hire two jabronis like me and Todd to go into office buildings dressed like a messenger with a boxer or something under our arm and say, hey, I've got a package for, you know, John Smallberries. Uh, there's no John Smallberries here. What? Oh, sh can I call my home office? Yeah, sure. You pick up the phone, you call the 1-800 number, you hang on the phone for a couple of minutes. You have a fake conversation. You've just charged up about five hundred dollars in call. Hang up. Sorry. Go to the next office right in the same building, and you just work your way down. You could you know twenty offices per floor, thirty floors in New York, and you know the charge gets eaten up, and you know they don't get the phone bill to who knows. And in the day, you thousands and thousands of dollars. So we tried it once and we're like, we lost our nerve. And we're like, this is crazy. We're going to get kicked out of college. We're at NYU. We're trying to make movies. Like, this is stupid. But this guy was ready to pay us cash. And he's like, I've got an army of people, can, you know, all over canvassing the city, just making calls to my stupid 1-800 number or whatever. Uh, I was pretty, I thought that was pretty smart. Yeah. I've, the, 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 uh, the 1-900 numbers that, I mean, I've heard a couple of scams uh, like that, you know? Yeah. Most of them are like calling, you know, to like Jamaica or Haiti or, right. you know, and they would charge whatever. And they would, they would do it for so many months and build up a credit line with the phone company that gate provided the, the line. Right. And then at some point when they were so millions of dollars in debt to them, they would close the company down, restart it in somebody else's name, yep. change offices and, and start all over again. And just, you know, so it, it was funny, like the guy that I knew that was kind of investigating this whole, what, many of those, he said, like, we knew, like we, we would go and we would look and we're like, he's selling it for 75 cents a minute. We're right. selling him the minutes for 85 cents a minute. He's <laughs> right. like, like, we know it's about to go under. Right. And he, right. But yeah, that's, uh, yeah, those, Back in those, the day. Are, those are always the big time scams. And then they, right. you know, eventually they fall apart. Same thing with the PPP loans. Like these guys are making tons of money. And they're doing great. And they're thinking, I'm brilliant. No, it just hasn't caught up to you. Exactly. It two always, years yeah. from later. What was your, what was your thing? I, 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 I know that you had, like, did you have a couple of things or? Um... I mean, I had several, but probably the easiest kind of to explain is it was bank fraud. Okay. And, and I had owned a mortgage company and eventually, you know, it was, we were doing fraudulent things in the mortgage company. Eventually I was placed on probation, federal probation for three years. And that's where the, the scam that I'm basically most kind of known for is there's something, do you know what a synthetic identity is? Uh, I think, but you, you might as well. Yeah, it's kind of like a, kind of like a, like a stolen identity, but it's not a real person or it's a, it's okay, a right, combination okay. of fake people. What I did was I went into social security and I figured out how to get social security to issue me social security numbers to children that don't exist. Got so I give them a fake birth certificate, fake shot record. They give me a, a social security number, whatever name I wanted. And then I would buy, go out into a, a, an area, you know, lower middle class area. And I would buy houses for, let's say for the sake of our argument, like $50,000. Mm -hmm. Well, one, I, I got the social security number and I would get secured credit cards. So after paying the minimum payment for six months, they would have 700 credit scores. Right. 
you only needed a 620 to borrow uh, to get a loan a mortgage from the bank right so plus of course i've got w2s pay stubs i have all the documents right, right sure. and so my person and i had eight or ten of these guys i w- we would go out and i would buy a house in their name for fifty thousand dollars I would record the sale of that house at 200,000. So if you went to public records, it looked like my, right. I just bought a house for 200,000. So what happened is you buy enough of those within an area, the whole area starts to go up. Yep. And when the bank, and if you want to borrow money against the house, you want to refinance your mortgage or get a mortgage, it, the bank sends somebody out or you send them an appraisal based on the comparable sales in the area, all of which are mine. Yep. The, bank, the bank says this thing's worth 210, 220, right. 240. This whole area is going through the roof. So we would then refinance the house, borrow the money. And so each person borrowed, you know, only one mortgage per house, five or six houses at each person. So a one million, one and a half million dollars, you'd make seven hundred and fifty thousand to right. you know nine hundred a million dollars per person. We would make the payments, of course, you know, for about five or six months, and then we'd stop paying. And then when, of course, when the, you know, the collection st- started coming in, we would get the letters saying, you know, hey, you're in foreclosure. I would then cut out, an, I cut out an article from the newspaper. This was back when you had newspapers, you know, you cut out the article. Well, we retyped the whole thing where there was like a 17 car pile up on Interstate 4. And someone was life flighted to Tampa General High Hospital, and I would insert my guy's name in there, <laughs> and I'd highlight it, right? And I'd write a letter from his sister saying, "My brother is in in a coma. Right. The doctors say even if he wakes up, he'll never work again. You might as well take the house." And of course, if they if the bank pulled re pulled his credit, they would see, well, this guy's got five mortgages, and he's got four personal loans and three credit cards or four credit cards, and they're all in default. Like this is right. clearly true. If you called his, his work, I was his work. You know, we had yep. multiple employers. They would say, I'm sorry, he's no longer here. He's right. sorry. Yep, there was an accident. It was checking out. Yeah. Right. And so they just foreclosed on the property and, right. you know, resold it. So I borrowed 11 and a half million dollars in like 18 months or something like that in uh, multiple people's names. A, a friend of mine got caught and uh, got caught running a scam that was connected to my scam. You know, he wanted right. in on it and something went wrong and he ended up getting caught and they put together a task force, which ultimately came after me. And then I went on the run for three years and I okay. continued to commit fraud. Right. So, uh, but the, what you might find interesting. So only since you, you mentioned this person's name is that the names predominantly the names of my borrowers were William blue James Red, um, Michael White, Lee Black, right? You know Brandon Green. So oh, you can imagine how how easy it was when my buddy got arrested. He said, "Listen, I know somebody who's running a much bigger scam," and he's like, "And I can prove it to you right now." Pull up the property appraiser's website for Hillsborough County. Red five foreclosures. William Blue seven right. foreclosures, you know, you know, it's like, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. And these, this, this guy currently owns four houses. He's about to buy another one in six months. They'll all be in foreclosure. Right. So, yeah. 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 Oh, I gotta be Mr. Pink. Exactly. <laughs> uh, that's so let me ask, I, I'm just uh, curious, like what made you go from, Hey, I'm, I've got a mortgage company. Like it just wasn't profitable enough or whatever. Like what made you say, I'm going to do this. It's very complicated scam. Um, you know, it, what it, it explaining it or it seems complicated, right? It, to me, it's like, it's like riding a bike. Like if you, if I explained to you about riding a bike right now, you would, and you'd never ridden a bike. It's impossible. But once you start riding the bike within a week, you're doing wheelies, you're jumping ramps, you're right. You're, you know, so to me, it was very, it, you know, owning that mortgage company. So I I had owned a mortgage company, like I said, prior to doing that scam, you know, I was already periodically changing W2s or making fake canceled checks. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So it started as small things because like, why did you start riding a bike? It's because I want to get around and my friends have bikes and you know, like there's a reason why you learn, go through that. Like what was the, yeah, the reason behind it. And you get emboldened by it. 
Right. You know, every time a loan went through and you closed it and you made your little $3,500 broker fee, then that was like, wow, like, like it worked. Right. You know, and the few times that I, uh, it's not even the few times, the many times we got caught, I, I was able to kind of learn from those experiences because mm -hmm. you'd have an underwriter call up and say, listen, this person's W-2 is fake. And you go, what? And they go, yeah. And you say, well, you, you're, are you telling me my borrower gave me a fake W-2? How, well, how did you, how'd you find it? And they go, oh, well, turns out that the tax ID number, we went on the web. One of the ways we check is we do this and this and this. And I thought next time that needs to match. Exactly. Uh, and so, you know, after three or four years of owning that, that mortgage company, I, I'd, I'd learned how to make although I hadn't really done it at the time, I knew it was possible to make synthetic identities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew it was possible to raise the purchase or to, re to record sales in public records at a higher level. Just, and you have to pay the reason people don't do this typically is you have to pay extra doc stamps. So if you buy a house for a hundred thousand dollars, you pay about $700 in doc stamps. Mm -hmm. If you just pay the other, another 700,000, I mean, I'm sorry, another $700, it, it shows up at two as a $200,000 sale. Right. So, you know, I, these were just little things that I learned and right. then I was able to manipulate that whole system. And, you know, and then I just made it worse for myself because when I came on, when I, when they came to arrest me, I was tipped off by a sheriff's deputy that was a friend of mine that they were going to come arrest me. The FBI was going to come arrest me. So I, I took off on the run for three years. You know, I only had a couple of days, so I was only able to leave Tampa with like 80 grand and you're not going to get far on 80 grand. So right. I immediately over the next three years, I borrowed about three and a half to four and a half million dollars running additional more scams, mm -hmm. a little bit more complicated. You know, I've so I've had 20 next year charges. <laughs> what? Yeah, exactly. Just making it worse. <laughs> Just longer. And worse. Yeah. So, you know, and I had the worst thing was too, is that, you know, by that point I was able to, I figured out how to go into a DMV, get them to give me a driver's license. I was able to get passports. The U S the state department could, would issue me passports. Uh, so, you know, the times that I would get caught running these scams, if I get handcuffed by the police and questioned, they bring me downtown, they question me. I'd convince them I hadn't done anything wrong. They let me go. Right. You know, I like, I, these are things that happened over and over again. I've numerous you know, and then of course it got worse and worse. It was, you know, there were news, tons of newspaper articles. Then I was in fortune magazine. I was in Bloomberg, oh boy. uh, datelines running. So, so, you know, it's just, it's like, it's like, I'm thinking, well, this will go away. <laughs> it's not going away. It's getting worse. Every time I turn around, there's another article. So, you know, eventually I end up getting caught and, you know, right. went to prison and. Well, I'm glad you kept it in the financial world and yeah. didn't uh, veer it because, because, you know, there is, you know, like, there are guys in our, you know, the cases that we cover that have that sort of like, I'm running a scam and then I need to also eliminate a person to, uh, to really, you know, get that insurance money or, you know, whatever. Um, Do you have our, one of those? Oh yeah. One of our first cases was a guy, he was, he had everything, uh, you know, impersonating people. Uh, his big thing though, was he, he, um, he became like a pastor. And he would, uh, you know, he knew the the re very religious people were probably the easiest to dupe. And he would meet these women and he would come across as, uh, you know, I'm doing all this charity work and all this stuff. And he seemed like the greatest guy. And then he would get all kinds of, you know, five different life insurances on that person. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I don't want to give too much away, but like, you know, came and swept her away from work. Uh, hey, I booked us a, a, an anniversary trip and they'd been married for a, a little while. So it didn't, it wasn't like an immediate thing. I mean, we've had people that kill each other on their honeymoon. And, but this guy, you know, he had waited a bunch of years. Uh, and then one day on their anniversary came to the woman's job, uh, car was packed. Don't worry. We don't have to go home. We're going right on vacation. I packed all your stuff for you. You dread flag. Uh, if someone packs your stuff for you and won't let you go home and call anybody, probably a red flag whisks her away to the uh, Colorado, uh, the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and then, yeah, and then she winds up, you know, off a cliff. And, you know, he swears it was an accident. She fell. She was taking the selfie or whatever. Um, but he had all these life insurances on her. Uh, and then also it turned out his first wife 
died in the same, not the exact same, but in, in also like was changing a car tire and the jack broke and fell and the car fell on her. And I he see. also this has been covered. Yeah, a little bit. Dude, by the way. Yeah, this way. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it just, uh, yeah, this was this to me was like the quintessential slaycation because this guy, yeah, this guy was great uh, in terms of you know pure evil and uh, yeah, his wives and and, and stuff like that. Um, but you know, again, you you kept it financial, uh, and and uh, this guy decided he had to he had to take lives to uh, to get what he wanted. Um, you know, I was going to say this, uh, was it, a slick Willie Sutton said, you know, they said, why do you rob banks? And he said, well, that's where the money is. <laughs> so exactly. Um, gosh, the, the, I was going to say that reminds me of that. Did you ever hear about there were, there were two brothers on, on a Mason company and they would hire like, uh, homeless people to work as laborers and they would give them a place to live like on like. They had two or three acres or something. They'd give them, put them in a shed. Right. And after they'd, they'd get an insurance policy out on them, they'd basically have them drink themselves to death. Yeah, I did hear about that. Or the insurance. Uh, it yeah. was. Yeah, the insurance money is like. I, and there's so many cases like that. There's so many stories that are, you know. It, it's funny, too. A lot of people will go on vacation. And, and I think it's part of the going on vacation is I think that they're basically like this person isn't from South America. Right. Like how, how much of an investigation can they do in South America about what's going on here? That, that happens a lot where, yeah, you know, what, what is the local and, and a lot of times the local, they, they, uh, the local police or whatever, like they don't want to make a big deal out of it anyway. They don't want to scare off tourists and make it seem like murders happen here. So they do try to bury a lot of these. Um, there was that famous case, you know, the woman with her friends, uh, Shanquilla Robinson went to, uh, Cabo with her friends and, you know, wound up, you know, found in the morning dead after a night of partying. And, you know, the friends said it was, they drank too much or whatever, but then there's a video of her like being beaten up by one of her friends and stuff. And it made national news, but the autopsy, the original autopsies, oh yeah, yeah. They just concurred. Uh, yeah, no big deal. Cause they just didn't want the publicity, but you know, uh, it, it was such a, uh, you know, a fervor back here in the States people. And then as new, as new evidence would come out like that, like, you know, the leaked uh, videotape of the girl being beaten up. It's like, wait, there's more here. And, and she had like, you know, damage to her face. It's like, that wasn't in the original autopsy. They were like, oh yeah, she must've drank too much. And so, yeah, but a lot of the local authorities don't want the publicity, don't want to make it seem like murders happen here. Um, but we do say, yeah, vacation is the, you know, I, I make the joke. I say, um, if you can't kill somebody on the vacation, then you have no business killing people because you just are not cut out for it. I mean, it's you're doing stuff that you don't ordinarily do. You're in weird position. I mean, you know, you know, you're you're kayaking, you're hiking, you're on cliffs, you're on mountain trails. There's very few people around. There's always drinking. There's always like nightlife stuff. Now we don't just cover, like, so we we say you know uh, we say you know. If, 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 if a couple, you know, if one murders the other, uh, that's a slaycation. If you go on vacation and you get murdered, we'll also cover that. Uh, there's some interesting cases like that. Couple goes on vacation, meets another couple. They seem like good people. And then after a night of partying, they don't show up to work when on Monday. What happened to them? And, uh, you know, trying to trace those, you know, those last moments and whatever. Was it the couple? Was it something else? Uh, did they just disappear? You know, um, so we, we, say, the, we say if you leave for vacation in the plane and you come home under the plane, then you've been on a, a location. Do you uh, do you ever interview like the uh, the te detectives or is this just research and then you got you kind of ask we, questions? Yeah, we might get there. But right now it's just uh, it's just they they research the hell out of it. And then I try to probe and ask questions and make off color jokes and and my wife gets mad at me. Um, so it's a it's a it's a funny dynamic. Um, what I was gonna say, oh good. <laughs> no, I was just I was just gonna say I was gonna say something like I forget what it was last night. Like like I, two days ago, my wife was just in, it. Something happened and she looked at me and she's like, "I am so glad that I married you." 
She's like, I mean, she's like, I love you so much. You were such a great guy. And then the next day we were having a conversation <laughs> at this desk. And I said something that I knew she was going to be like, what right. did you just say? And she, I looked up at her and I said something. I, anyway, whatever it was. And I looked at her and she goes, why am I married to you? <laughs> said, Wait a minute. Are you the same person who just, I, no, I believe me. I get that. I get that a lot too. Uh, I mean, it's funny because it's like I'll make – sometimes I'll make a joke or I'll have a joke that I'm like I shouldn't say it, but I got to say it. So what I'll do is I'll say, you know, what I was going to say was – and then I'll say the joke as if like I didn't say it. But now I, you know, I, I'm you know, i just blurting it out because I was going to – I thought this thing, but it's it's terrible. And then my wife will just look at me and she's like, you're such an asshole. I know. And it's like, you know, we're recording. And she's like, oh, yeah, I know. But that, I mean, I think that's part of the fun, and and you know, we do bring our marriage dynamic into it, and and you know, raising our daughter, and um, you know, and it's it's great because you know we've all known each other for over thirty years, so it's like we have a camaraderie that uh, you can't really fake. Um, right. Yeah, we try not to be that podcast that's just laughing at like nonsense and nothing. You know, it's like let's make sure you laugh at something that's actually funny, and let's you know tell the stories. Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, I know you love, yeah, you love the little crime thing. Like, I have a story that I think you'll appreciate. It's not a, it's not a murder story, but uh, you know, it's something. Um, I worked in a in a factory in Hackensack, New Jersey, and we made car washes. All the all the all the machinery that you'd find in a car wash. Okay. The arms, the curtain, uh, the conveyor that pulls your car, and there was a guy there named Carlos who was the cutter. He would cut all the angles and the flats and the, the beams and the tubes and stuff. And Carlos loved to steal. Uh, this guy was just addicting to stealing, the rush of stealing. It didn't even matter what it was. He just loved stealing stuff. I had, I had fucked up my car. So Carlos offered to give me rides to and from work. Uh, in exchange, he would uh, raid my parents' like freezer and like take, my dad worked in the meat business. So he would take steaks and, and burgers. He's like, I'll take the little chickens. And I was like, those are capons. He's like, yeah, whatever. And so this guy loved, you know, he loved taking the meat uh, in payment for, for rides home. But the thing was, every ride was fraught with danger because he had a little pickup truck. And as we're driving, he would just pull over and jump out of the car and grab something off someone's lawn, bikes, a lawn gnome, a garden hose, whatever. He'd just grab it, throw it in his truck and just drive off. And I'd be like, what are you doing? He's like, hey, man, this kid's got to learn. You don't leave your bikes out when Carlos is around. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So at each speed, too, like, I was like, at least stop at the red light so you don't get pulled over for that. Anyway, um, there was a, a warehouse across from our factory, and it had a loading dock. And our warehouse did not have a loading dock. So we always had to use their loading dock to put the machinery onto the big uh, tractor trailers to, to ship it. And while we were there, he noticed that the warehouse was open and he could just go right in. And they had like boxes of clothing and stuff. So he would just go in, help himself to a box, run back to our factory. He'd open it up and then he'd try to sell the stuff. Hey, guys, uh, T-shirts, uh, five dollars, three for ten. And the guys were like, you just stole that. <laughs> and it's like they would, they would just help themselves to it. But eventually he started taking so many boxes that the warehouse knew something was up. So they, they kept that door closed. Didn't stop Carlos. He'd go in a window, open the window, Carlos in, box out, Carlos out, window closed, off he goes. So then they built a big fence around the warehouse and they put a dog, a vicious, like early days of pit bulls, like when, the, you know, the, the most ferocious dog you've ever seen into, you know, inside the fence. And I was, you know, snarling, barking. I, I was afraid to eat my lunch outside, even though it was in the fence. Like if it got loose, it would kill you. And I said, I guess it's over, Carlos. And he's looking at the dog and he's just rubbing his chin. He's like, oh, man, it looks like a happy dog to me. Whatever, dude. Needless to say, yeah, they put the dog inside the warehouse when we used the loading dock. And we were terrified. We we're like, if this dog gets out, we're dead. I had gotten hired to work on a film shoot for a week or so. So I disappeared, uh, did the film shoot, come back. And when I get to work, Carlos drives up. Uh, drives me to work. Uh, I noticed that there's no dog in the yard. And I say to Carlos, I was like, oh man, did it kill somebody? And he just kind of smiles or whatever. And I'm like, oh, this dog must have ripped somebody apart. Uh, that day, Carlos like, hey, you want to ride home? Sure. 
get in the car, we're driving. I say, did you forget where I lived? You made a left instead of a right. He goes, I want to show you something. He pulls up in front of his house. He whistles. The dog comes running out of the house. He stole the dog. I was going to say, I knew he, I knew he, he knew stole the dog. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I was just like, yeah, hats off to Carlos, wherever he is, uh, whatever prison he's in now. Or maybe not. I don't know. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I've always been fascinated by stories about crime. Uh, and then, you know, these, these stories were just uh, the slication stories are just so, I mean, I, I don't want to use the word fun because there's, you know, people, you know, are getting killed, but they're so tricky and convoluted and twisty and turny. Um, you, you really won't know until the very end, was it an accident or was it murder? And uh, even even at the end, you're like, I don't know, there's still something there. And sometimes the people are caught, and sometimes they let go. How how many episodes uh, do do you have per season? Well, we just um, you know we just started. Like we haven't even figured out what a season is. We've recorded eleven so far. We're launching. Uh, the idea is to record two two a month uh, and just stay ahead of our schedule. And, right. you know, uh, it's, it's interesting because our, with our kids educational podcast, we never did a season. We just keep going. We have 500. Yeah, okay. I think yeah. with this, we'll probably, you know, maybe 20 something episodes and we'll call that a season. Um, you know, uh, well, I mean, I guess now you don't really have to have a season. I was thinking more yeah. kind of TV ish kind yeah. of, um, well, and, and it depends typically when you go to a production company like they they typically buy a certain or fund a certain amount right so they'll be like okay your season's 12 or four we need 14 of these or um are, are you concerned about there being an end i mean l listen how many high profile like it's got to be high profile enough for you guys to be able to find them right i mean that that's how we started we you know because i i said the first one I was like, man, it's location. And, and then we got excited. And then it's like, okay, let's see if we can find 50 or more, then there's probably something. We found right. over well over 100. Oh, okay. So, you know, uh, they're not all going to be super twisty and turny sometimes, uh, but they all have something. Yeah, we, we, you know, uh, they, they all have something that's going to suck you in and, uh, you know... Um, We've even done a couple that are like two parters because there's so much, you know, you going think on. It's going one way and then all of a sudden a new piece of evidence. And it's like, oh my God, we can talk another hour about this. It's like, all right, then we will. We'll do they they surprised me with one the other day. There was like, um Jerry started recapping. I'm like, why are we recapping? I know where we are. He's like, because you think you know where we are, but we're right. gonna do the rest in part two. I was like, Oh shit, we've already been talking for you know, fifty minutes. Um like, okay. So we did, yeah, we did a two parter. On, uh, on a case yeah i was gonna, I, I interviewed um a couple of actually they were they're actresses that t are turned podcasters and they do a podcast called uh i met my murderer online mm. yeah, and, yeah yeah the problem is is like because they're basically going off of people that met like on dating apps right like i just like how many are there yeah that might be a little bit more finite yeah um, well that, so. yeah that's why i said yeah we, we we cover people that murder each other on the on vacation or if you get murdered and then the white whale if you go on vacation and then see a crime of opportunity and actually murder somebody else and then leave because you're like hey i'm in a far country I, I can probably get away with it yeah uh, what's the guy that murdered oh gosh the girl holloway oh natalie holloway yeah natalie Vander, holloway Vander Sloot. uh so we haven't even done that one yet that oh, okay. one could be like a three-parter, you know, it's like, but it's so known that we've kind of avoided it's, 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 but there's new revelations. So, I mean, it is, but you know, here's the problem is like, I've always heard bits and pieces, bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. Right. And now it's come out to the, to where he's basically, hasn't he basically admitted it and been, yeah. no, so, there's actual closure on it, uh, after years of, of nothing. So, yeah. Right. So, so now you could probably do an episode, even if it was just one episode on the highlights of it, because yeah. like, I don't know the whole, I, I know bits and pieces and I'm sure that's a sick guy. Like uh, yeah. he's, I mean, the, the fact is, is like, I don't want to say this, like murdering 
one person it's almost like okay murdering one person okay but murdering but then he murders another person you know what i'm saying so but yeah he clearly is just a a serial killer that maybe right. only got to you know maybe only got to two he may there may be other people out there who knows but right. this is like you already know the scrutiny you're under right well like you said you do the one thing you get away with it and you, you become think, a oh. right you know and then you're like the polar bear that got a taste for it and you're like i can i can do it again um in fact he's probably thinking like i'm the last person they would think Right. I mean, I, you know, after everything I've been to, that guy would never murder somebody. Look at all the scrutiny and look, you know, I, I don't know. But we definitely will cover Natalie Holloway. We've, I think, we avoided it because it was so known. Um, you know, like there are cases that we do that are, are no. And, and look, we just discovered there was a Lifetime movie uh, made on one of our cases um, about a guy who took his uh, fiance or actually uh, they, they had just got married. Honeymoon, Great Barrier Reef. He's a Mr. Pro scuba diver, and she's never scuba dived, and she's terrified. And he won't even let her take the lessons. Like, no, 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 I've got it, I've got it. And they lied in their interviews so that she would just be able to scuba dive without even getting the lesson. Is it just a, a guy who's got murder on his mind, or is he just this alpha male asshole who's like, I, I can I can teach better than they can, trust me, just right. be with me. Well, they go down there. She starts to panic, and uh, he's trying to fix her breathing apparatus. is not working something, blah, blah, blah. And suddenly she starts to sink, and he gets panicky, and he goes up to the surface. And then she's found dead, and uh, they, they try to rescue her, but she's, she's already gone. Then it comes out like, oh, some other diver thought he saw them struggling, and he thought he saw him pulling at her, at her uh, you know, respirators, you know, and then it, so then that came out, but then something else came out that like the respirator makes a noise or something if it's, and it didn't make, you know, so there's like little weird evidence that, that swings it back and forth like a pendulum, like, oh, he's guilty. Oh, wait, maybe not, you know? Uh, oh yeah. Cause he had claimed that something was wrong with his thing. And then they tried to say like, well, that would never happen, but then they proved that that can happen and that it did happen. So it's like, you just never, you never quite know. Uh, and then he escaped. He got back to the States and then Australia wanted him like, to, you know, but they don't have an extradition treaty or whatever. They weren't going to send him back, but then he went back on his own. Uh, yeah. So they, they, these cases are convoluted and uh, they're really cool. And uh, as far as true crime goes, you know. I was going to say, there's one, I was thinking about one that it's not, a, I don't, th it's not a murder because it was a, I think it was a couple that went out like scuba diving and they were left by the boat like oh. they got too far away and they just got left and they just said okay they got eaten by sharks like is that the, is that the uh open water that yeah they made a movie yeah yeah, yeah. So it's that. just horrible horrible well, yeah i like shark movies so of course oh. i saw that one yeah uh they, they they counted wrong and uh they thought they were they, they counted somebody twice or something like that and then they left them there um yeah but uh, that could be on our show because it they definitely died on a vacation. So we that, that fits under the vacation umbrella. Like I said, if you leave in the plane and come home under the plane, if you pack a bag and come home in a bag, it's just like that. You're good. You're good. You Yeah, good for you. Right. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, it's horrible. I know. Wow. I know. I know. What kind of karma am I building up with this? Yeah, I was going to say, this is going to come. This is one of those things you're going to have to answer to. Right. <laughs> answer for, sorry. You know, it's funny because I say all the time, like my wife is so, you know, she's got the best voice of the three of us. She's the one that sounds like a podcaster. Uh, and she, you know, her whole thing is like, she's doing true crime. She just wants to understand the human psyche and how are people capable of doing so. This is, this is that. And this is part of the women thing. Like they want to know, they want to know, can these people be fixed? Uh, what is it? What do I look for? Uh, why, you know, how have I gotten away? You know, I'm lucky that it wasn't me, but it could have been me, blah, blah, blah. So she's coming from that angle. I'm like, people are going to love you. Jerry, he does research and he's very empathetic and he almost like doesn't like the true crime genre, but he, he understands that like some of these stories need to be told and he wants to, you know, champion the victims and, and you know, whatever. So I said, people will like or be neutral on him. And then they got me. And I'm like, I'll, I'm the asshole that people, yeah. they'll either like, they'll, they'll think I'm funny or they'll be like, this guy's an asshole. 
But Listen, you know I, I, that's the, I'd rather play that part. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Don't rage and listen just to fucking yell at me. So, but you know, listen, people, she's never going to understand the human psyche. I can tell you right now, I was in prison for 13 years and people are just horrific. Right, They're just right. horrible. We're, we're a horrible species. We really are. Right. Right. If we went away and the animals just took over, it'd be probably better. I, well, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but it, when, you know, I was in prison, I, I wrote, I, I started writing true crime stories. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. So like, I wrote fictional or, or or nonfiction. No, no, true crime. Like these are because think about it. Imagine the wealth of of uh, oh, you mean the stories, of the, right? The stories of the other inmates, right, 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 right. So and with um, when you said Todd Phillips, uh, Todd Phillips. So I wrote a a book on a guy named Ephraim Deveroli. Okay. And oh. War Dogs. Yeah, sure. the, movie, the movie War Dogs. Sure, so. Sure, sure. I, I was locked up with him and I had just finished my own memoir. Yeah. So I, I talked to him about writing, you know, how, that he should write a book, you know, and I had, a, I said, Oh, I got a literary agent if you want one. And he, you know, and so we had a conversation and he was, I was like, you know, he, he said, oh, I could never write it. I could never write a, a, a right. book. He said, because, you know, he's like, I'm my ADD. I'm, I'm bipolar. Right. He said, I'm all over the places. I couldn't focus long enough. And I said, okay. I said, well, you know, you could get somebody on the street to write it like a ghostwriter. Mm -hmm. He clearly had tons of money. And I said, you know, I, I'll, if you want, I'll help you write an outline. And he was like, you know, I'll think about it. Well, later on, months later, Todd Phillips bought the rights yeah. to the Rolling Stone article based on his story. Right. Um, but it, it was, the story was based on his co-defendants version of the story. Mm. But of course he's the main character. He's right. the more, you know, the other guys there. Right. But, right. right. Uh, and so you've seen the movie, like the bulk of it, even though it's David Packhouse telling, you know, he's narrating mm -hmm. the, the interest, more interesting of the two characters is, is that from Deborah Rowley. Yeah, sure. So, you know, he comes to me and we talk and, and he, I told him I'd help him write the outline. And so we start writing an outline and then he asked if he could read my book. So he read my book and he said, bro, you should, you should write my story. And I was like, oh, I've, I, I, I said, I'm not, I'm not a, like a, really a writer. And he's like, you, that bro, your, your story's great. You, what are you talking about? This, yeah. You can do this. So I end up writing his memoir. It's called Once a Gunrunner. And then he leaves with it, doesn't talk to me, just blows me off. <laughs> then he publishes the book and he sues Todd Phillips and Warner Brothers. Oh, I didn't know that part. While I was in prison, I then try and uh, enter the lawsuit. You know, I file. Right. Uh, paperwork saying, hey, I, yeah, I want yeah, to I, I wrote this. intervene. This guy ripped me off, and now he's suing Todd Phillips based on the book. He was saying that Todd Phillips stole his manuscript, which, in fact, they did, I believe, based on Devaroli's uh, motion, that that Warner Brothers did actually get a hold of his manuscript because he they were he was shopping it around to do a Ooh. documentary or another. You know, because keep in mind, these projects are going on at the same time. Todd Phillips, they hadn't even finalized the the uh, script at the time, or the you know the, the screenplay had been written. It was rewritten once. Once they got F um, Jonah Hill to play yep. the guy uh, Ephraim, yep. they rewrote the script again. But by that point, they had acquired the manuscript. Now this is according to Devaroli's uh, um, man uh, his motion, and he actually has a connection. They actually did send it to the vice to the son of one of the vice presidents of Warner Brothers. They sent it to his son, who does documentaries. Right. So there's a direct connection there. Yeah. So. And, and even it's funny too, because in their, all their responses to the mo all the uh, court proceedings, never once did Warner brothers say, we never got a hold of his, they never denied it. Right. But what they did was they altered the story so much. They said that basically the movie's fiction. Oh, wow. So then they turned around and sued Warner saying you advertise it as being a true I was story say it was not to advertise as a fictional movie. Right. And and they were like, so now there's something called the Lanham Act. They're like, now you violated the Lanham Act, which oh. means that you knowingly lied to the public. So now they sued. So finally Warner comes in and they, they settle a lawsuit with him. I exit prison and I'm still in the lawsuit with Deveroli. So Deveroli settles with me. Oh, wow. But, 
in the meantime, while this whole thing's going on, this is years of battling and I'm in prison. Like the idea that you can fight a, a civil a lawsuit from in prison is ridiculous. But I happened to be in a prison where there were a lot of lawyers. Right. So I oh, also, <laughs> right. So which will do, which will work for nothing. Right. Like they're just trying to pass their time. Very Shawshank. Right. Yeah. Um, and what I, what I ended up doing was while this was happening, I'm still writing stories. So I had written all of these stories while I was in there. And you know, you hear so many stories, like being in prison, you'd hear a guy's story and you would go, how is that not a movie? Right. How is that not? And you, you could see that some, you know, sometime you'd read their, their, uh, case, you know, their paperwork they would have, they'd, maybe they'd be fighting their case or you'd read their transcripts and their, you know, the various, uh, FBI 302s, which is like, you know, cro- uh, chronologically kind of documents the case and right. interviews, that sort of thing. And you're like, how is this? This is the most insane thing I've ever heard. But the truth is a lot of these guys, they don't have high school diplomas. And, mm-hmm. and even then they can't really write their story. They're not writers. And, and they can't take on a project that's going to take three to six months and they can't do the research and they can't. So what I did was I started writing their stories and some of them were full blown books. Right. Some of them were just, you know, a nine or 10,000 word synopsis, which is essentially like a, an article yep. of the story. And, you know, I did that for, I did that probably the last four or five years of my sentence. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that made my time just go by so quickly, sure, sure. so quickly. It was, it was real. And that's why, that's kind of how I ended up. And, produ- and productively, you know. Right. Well, I also got some guys in Rolling Stone magazine. I optioned their life rights. Uh, I, I, then when I got out, I optioned some guys' life rights, uh, some uh, other guys, uh, you know, working with multiple production companies. And, and I'm sure you know this. You're always working with, like, if I told you all the things that are going on right now, it sounds great. But honestly, I've been out of prison for four years and they they always sound great just before the bottom falls out and you start over and the bottom falls out and you start right. over. Like, yeah. I, so it all sounds great right now. Right. Until it's not. Yeah. Right. I mean, uh, yeah, totally. I totally know exactly what you're talking about. And yeah, you have to have a million oars in the water and like, are any of them actually going to push the boat? Cause they, you know, it, it changes overnight. Uh, I was going to say like, how, how is you, you know, how is what you did like not a show? How is there not a, a, a TV series based on all these? But uh, then again, at the same time, they don't like necessarily crime. Like the, like the, the true crime genre is, is murder. And if it's not murders and stuff now, granted, and maybe some of your stories, are murders, but you know, you said like, how is this not a movie? Uh, one of my teachers at NYU was like, uh, writing teacher had a great uh, phrase. He said, "There are ideas, and there are movies, and when you can tell the difference between them, then you can make money in this business." So there's a lot of great ideas. Wow, that's a great idea. But is it a movie? A movie has to have all these different parts and a character that's relatable and an arc and 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 you know all this stuff, three acts and. You know, so there's a lot of stuff like that's an amazing story, but does that story translate into a movie? Or maybe it's like you said, maybe it's an article, or maybe it's a novel, or maybe it's a, a book of short stories that you know that's part of you know a collection, you know, or it's an anthology, or it's you know it's a crime series that each episode is its own thing. So yeah, there's there's many different ways to to do it. But like yeah, I'm I'm listening to what you're saying. Like you know, uh, I want to get your book. Uh, yeah. You know, but that's really that's really interesting about the the war dogs thing. Uh, yeah, it's funny. I actually wrote a book about the uh, that whole thing because the the battle from inside of the prison is so hilarious. Right. And so it's you know it's it's outrageous the way we're even finding things out. Like literally, the book was published, right? And I hadn't heard from Devaroli or the literary agent. They were still pitching the book. Then we stopped talking. They stopped returning or start, start, stopped answering the phone, stopped yeah. returning e- emails. I have no access to the internet. And then one day I'm sitting down with a bunch of guys and this inmate comes by and he goes, Hey, he said, Cox, you making any money on that book? And I go, what book? And he goes, he said, um, Devaroli's book. And I went, no, I said, they, they, they never, they've never got a publisher. And he goes, what are you talking about? And he I opens up, no, no. He opens up oceans drive magazine. Oh, and there's a there's a big picture where Devaroli's got about a hundred books behind him, and he's at the 
at the Miami Book Fair Spider-Man. signing books. And this and is I'm exactly like, the book you wrote. Yes. Yeah, oh, my, he even put my name on it. Like, my name's on it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't like I, I didn't do a whole ghostwriting. Like, I'm in prison. I'm not trying to get the money. Right. You know, there's like, like you could get, you could have given me $100,000 in prison. I can still only buy $300 worth of commissary a month. Like, I can only, like, it changes nothing for me. Right, right, right. right. They're not going to let me out of jail if I, because I owe $6 million. If I gave the government $100,000, they'd be like, yeah, thanks. Exactly. You owe $6 million. You're not getting out of jail. Like, so, the right. money it was the, right. yeah, it was about getting out. And, you know, by this point, guys are coming up to me saying, Cox, you, when you get out, you got to do a podcast. And I was like, what's a podcast? Like right. that, that term didn't even show up in, uh, yeah. you know, in, it wasn't even a term until t- 2009. What, what, what year is this, by the way? This is uh war dogs came out in what? 20. Oh gosh. Eight, eight, 17, 18. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, um, you know, guys are telling me you got to do some, a true crime, right. a true crime podcast. And I don't even know what that is. Yeah. You could do one on YouTube. You could do one on right. Spotify. I don't know what these are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These aren't things I was locked up in 2006. I don't know. I've never been on YouTube. <laughs> YouTube. Like, guys are trying to explain to me what a podcast. Are. I'm like, so it's like a radio, like a radio program. No, it, it is, but it's not. Like, what does that mean? Right. It's like a little, they like a, 45 minute radio program. And where does it go? Well, they put it on different platforms. What does that mean? It's like a website, kind of yeah. like a website, but not. And what does that mean? Like no idea. So uh, anyway, yeah. So when I got out, that's, you know, that's like, that's how I ended up here. Right. You know, and, and I tried. Brilliant. brilliant what you did. Uh, the more I, the more I, I mean, I, you know, I, I just was, you know, looking into it yesterday when we decided we were going to do this, uh, I started looking into it. Yeah. I was like, wow. And it's a, it's a, it's a cool niche and you've got the, you know, you've got the inside, uh, you know, like you're, you're a true like expert in what you're doing, you know? Uh, that's why I don't do anything really on violent crime because that's how you're and, and there are a few murders. Like I've done stuff, but I'm never talking to the murderer. It's always like someone on the case got murdered by another co-defendant or, you know, there was a, or the guy that I'm talking to was blamed for the murder, but he right. didn't do it. And then later it came out, he didn't do the murder, but he went to jail for something else, let's say, you know? And so you're like, okay, so, we have to include the murder and what happened, but but it's not the not- crux of it, right? Yes. Uh, or, uh, yeah, like I said, uh, you know, uh, the the good thing about podcasting is you can just do it on your own. You don't have to have somebody say yes or no. Yeah, because we do when, when you're doing a movie. I mean, I write a movie. I sold it. It still took five years to get made. And countless right. rewrites, and every time, oh, we had a director, and then the director got fired because they didn't like he he wasn't doing what the studio wanted. So the second director came in, and then an actor comes in, and then changing the movie again over and over. And you know, it takes five years to get made. Um, TV shows go faster in some regards, but also a lot of you know the studio and the network and the this and the that. You know, a podcast. I mean, the brilliant thing is you do what you want, and you put out what you came up with, you know, like our who smarted podcast. We don't get notes. We give the notes. I give the notes to the writers and we put out the show exactly the way we want it. And it's, you know, uh, and it, it's, it's fun with Slaycation. We're, we're funding it ourselves. we we don't, we didn't sell it to a, a place or anything. We're going to just, you know, because we see the, the model, you, you put it out yourself, you build up an audience through promo swaps and whatever. And then, uh, you know, if it's good content, you know, hopefully the people come, but, you know, you build it up and then you sell the ads and then have a subscription and, and you know, it, it, it's, it's a viable thing without having to hear no from a studio or a network or whatever. Yeah. And it, it takes forever to get the, first of all, it takes forever to go through the whole pitching process. And then when it's all said and done, you're lucky if you get the no. You, know, you ever notice that? Like sometimes you just get the blow off and you're like, and you get the, oh, we're going to talk to Sally next Tuesday. Oh, we're waiting for John to come back from vacation. Oh, we're, we're not buying anything for the next two months. It'll be in the next pitch session. Oh, and, and they can drag you for six months to a year before that you finally go. Very true. Nobody wants to say no. We've built up enough of a reputation in the TV space that at least we get the no. But now in the podcast space, we've had 
companies reach out to us, ask us if we want to work partner with them, create a show together. We come up with IP. Great. They love it. Give us a budget. We give them a budget. And then they blow us off. And we're waiting for three months. And it's like, are we doing this or not? Well, we had a really bad... I don't know. What does that have to do with, like, I don't we've been doing this, you know? So it's like... Oh, I've listen, I've done that with TV series. And then suddenly you think you've got something. You've all had the, the meetings. You're already writing the episodes. Right. And guess what? They get bought out by Disney. Right. The merger. They, the merger. Yeah. There's always the yeah, merger. And you're like, okay, but but no, no, but we had a, we had a, no, yeah. I know everything's on hold. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh my God. You know what I better do? I better just start pumping out content on YouTube. That's what I better do. There you go. Right. Exactly. Exactly. You you're know. playing it smart. You know, so yeah, well, uh, playing it smart based on default, right. <laughs> not because right. not because it was a part of the plan. Gotcha. The best offense um, is a good defense. Um, so okay, well, listen, we'll, we'll we'll put the um like we can put the the link into or in the description box. Okay. Or um, uh, floor flacation. Yeah. And and matter of fact, if you could send me. You got. I'm sure you have some artwork. Yeah, I'll have Nick send everything over. Gacy didn't do it. No. Uh, so well, and then, <laughs> it's better. It's better what he does. It. He's not. He wasn't the greatest painter. Better listen, the the the, uh, God, the um the painting of him painting the clown. Mm. You know, just so creepy. Right. And, and your clowns in general are creepy. You know, his whole thing, his whole, like I've watched several documentaries on, uh, on the whole thing and it, his, just the arrogance, um, just ac- across the board, he was just such a, a, a an odd guy. Yeah. He, on the phone, he would, he, even to us, he wouldn't even admit, he would just be like, I don't know who put those bodies there. The only thing you can charge me with is running a cemetery without a license. <laughs> we're like, oh. Oh, come on. Right. Give it up. We but, put the phone in the shower because it was so bad. Like, we take a shower afterwards. But we're like, well, we should just put the phone in the shower so we can shower during the call because it's so grimy. But at the same time, it's super intriguing. Um, you know, nobody else was getting that call. So we were like. Right. Anyway. Well, um, yeah, definitely send me some art and send me a, uh, send me a, a, a headshot of you. Because otherwise, you're going to end up getting a screenshot. Yeah, you know, my true. my editor will just take a screenshot of you and make a make a um. He'll make a thumbnail with that. So if you want to have any hope of getting a picture that you're okay with, okay, you you really need to hit send some kind of a headshot. Okay, we'll do. All right. Well, I really appreciate it. Give me give me one second. Hold yep. on. Let me do this. This is my. I got to do this this thing. Yep. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching. Do me a favor, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell so you get notified of videos just like this. Leave me a comment and I will try and respond. Also, if you want to check out Slaycation, please check the description box. We're going to put all the links in the description box and I really appreciate it. Please consider joining my Patreon. Thank you very much. See ya. Here's all. The average brain games viewer was like late 30s. So it was like a tremendous drop. And we knew tons of kids were interested in this. So when we stopped doing brain games, we did a show called Brain Child for Netflix. And we did a season of that, 13 episodes. And we expanded beyond just the brain to like talk about all kinds of things like space and the ocean, uh, emotions and stuff like that. So that uh, we just got data like that's in the top 15% of all Netflix shows uh, still uh, today, e- even though we came out in 2018 or something. So kids are still watching the hell out of that. So that was sort of our entertainment slash educational, you know, journey. And then, uh, yeah, then we got into podcasting, like I said, um, with Blue Smarted. But Slaycation is a chance for us to be on mic, be ourselves, be funny, but also get into these dark cases. And like I said, the, the cases on Slaycation are so twisty and turny. And people, you know, criminals, you, you know, they, they make, they, they're brilliant in so many aspects. And then they make a colossal error that how, how could they do that? Yeah. You know, so for, I'll give you an example. Um, there was a guy, he, 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 he pushed his wife off a cliff and made it seem like an accident and he would have gotten away with it, except he had a map in his car of an X on the remote spot where, where she was found. 
And it's like, yeah. wait, what? Complete, yeah. Just no. I, listen, I I have some friends that are brilliant, and then they were caught just that they would do the dumbest things. But before before I mention that, I want to say one: I like your Salvador Dali clock. Oh, thank you. Um, and uh, uh, the. Well, and then I was going to ask, like, what are some of your favorite uh, um, episodes or cases? Uh, sure. But what I was going to mi- also wanted to mention is, I have a friend that would hit his. He had a, a a quick version of his crime is that, you know, he was able to make fake IDs. Right. So. So he's got a guy that makes fake IDs. He's big on putting people together. So one, that's a problem because you're involving lots of people in your in your crimes. But whatever. The point is, he can. He's got somebody who can make fake IDs. So he ends up he ends up getting connected with a guy that worked in the fraud department for Bank of America. He tells them about something that's been happening, and he's like, and it happens at banks everywhere, and there's really nothing we can do about it. Even though we know there's a fraud being committed, there's just nothing we can do. It's just the cost of doing business. Right. And that is that take, take yourself, for example, you've got $13,000 in your bank account. You go and you send your, your debit card to somebody in another state. You tell them to go into, let's say the post office and tell them, go buy $9,000 worth of money orders. So they do. Or even if you went to a, a car, a store and went and bought something for nine grand, you go and you do it. And then for uh, you know, whatever, 45 minutes later, you walk into the, the bank and I say, my money's gone. My money's gone. Yeah. So by law, uh, the ele- electronic transfer act, they have to put the money back. Right. Now they can investigate it. And if right. they investigate and they find out that it was that you were involved, then they can reverse the charges. Right. Well, here's, here's what's interesting about that is this guy was like, so the, the bank employee tells me this. And he said, now, I don't know what you can do with this, but I feel like you're the kind of guy that could do something with it. I'm just letting you know, this is the thing. No bank investigates any any of these crimes under $10,000. So if you take eight or 9,000, they, they the worst they will do is close your account. Right. So what he did was he was like, okay. So he went and he thought, if I have guys, if I give people fake IDs and have them go open bank accounts in other states. Right. And each person can open about three accounts before the the fourth bank. They start asking questions like, hey, right. you've opened three other accounts in the last two days or whatever. <laughs> so he said, if, so if each guy puts about $10,000 in the account, I remove 9,500 or 9,000. They go in and 20 minutes later or five minutes later and ask for some cash right. and have the bank tell them, you don't have any money. You've got like $200. Right. What do you mean you want 9,000 or you, you want $500? You what are you talking about? I got over ten thousand dollars, and they're like, in, "In another state that I couldn't possibly be in." So how, right, uh, right. So and he, and he said, "My problem with that was, where do I find these people? Like, who's going to do that?" Yeah. And I was like, "Yeah, yeah." So I well, where did you find him? He said, first appearance." Now he'd been arrested over and over again. So he said, "I went to the courthouse, and when people get arrested and they go for their first appearance, typically the prosecutor stands up and says, Your Honor." We're not giving this guy any bond or we're giving him $5,000 in bond. He's been arrested twice for credit card fraud. He's been arrested for um, check fraud. He's been arrested for telecommunications fraud. And he goes, they basically read their resume. Right. He said, he goes, so I would sit there for two hours and I would end up with five people's names. He said, I, he said if they didn't get bond, I would write them a letter, mm-hmm. money on their books and say, hey, Call me. I'm going to bond you out of jail. He would. They would call him on a phone that is a burner phone, and he'd explain the scam to them over the phone, and say, "Now, if you're interested, I will bond you out." He right. would. They, of course, these are career criminals. They're like, "Man, yeah, just really. bond, bond me out." Yeah. So he said, "You know, if you bonded out like four guys, he's and typically their bonds are five hundred bucks, a thousand. I'm going to give them ten percent down. It's nothing. You know, it's five thousand dollar bond." He's like, "But they're broke because most of them are drug addicts." Um, so he said, I would bond them out. And when they would go to get their property, they would, he would have his wife go and put a phone in their property. Cause when you, ha- the, the, where your property is held, you can go there and say, Hey, John Smith is about to be bonded out. I'm his wife or I'm a friend of his. He doesn't have a cell phone. Can you put this in with this property? And they mm-hmm. were, they would always go. Yeah, of course they put it in the bag. And so when he got it, he would get a 
the phone. He'd call the number. Right. They'd say, take a photo of yourself, send it to me. They'd send it to him. They would then send him, send him the IDs, a plane ticket. He'd go open the accounts, wait a couple of days, get the debit cards, scan them, send the duplicate deb- debit cards back to Florida. They would go take the money out of the account. And then he, they'd go back and the guy would go back in the bank and he was sending two or three people every single month doing this. So he's making no, the, the scam was netting two, 300,000 a month. He's giving the guys 30%. And he said they were always good for a trip or two. And then they get back on drugs or they get rearrested. But I always thought it was brilliant. And the way yeah. his whole kind of scam unraveled was this. One day he and his wife, ba- basically it's a little bit more complicated. But this was one of the stupid things that he did. Right. That got them onto his trail. He and his wife were on vacation and right. they used a stolen credit card to buy their hotel room for a week. And I'm like, you've got half a million dollars in the bank. You've got a hundred thousand something dollars in cash. Why would you use a stolen credit card? And he goes, well, why would I pay for it when I have a stolen credit card? I'm like, because this is you. Why would you take that risk? Why would you? He's like, well, I just and that got him caught. Eventually, that's one of the things that led to his right, right. Yeah, there's well, there's multiple things that ended up, you know, converging. But that's one of and that's but that's the kind of things that he would do. That's such a cell phone. That's such a like. You, I'd expect it to be one of these knuckleheads that he hires somebody. Yeah, yeah it, it was. No, he owned it himself. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, and that's what always tends to get these guys that I, I would meet. It would be like one little thing. It's like, why'd you do that? Why didn't you just give the person the money back? Like out of a guy whose whole Ponzi scheme came undone because of like a a hundred thousand dollars that suddenly he took from somebody and their daughter started freaking out and said they started saying they were going to call the police, they're going to call the FBI, they're going to do this, they're going to do that. Something's wrong. I don't think something's wrong about something's wrong about your financial Ponzi mm-hmm. scheme. And instead of him saying, "Listen, I'm just going to give you the money back," he 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 didn't. I go, "Why didn't you?" And he goes, "You know, I mean, she was being such a jerk about it. I'm like, you stole fifty million dollars, right?" It's a hundred grand. Well, he's like, I know, but it made me so mad. And it was just like, what do you think? These guys do stupid things. Yeah. Oh, I, I got a scam for you. You, you, you are the perfect guy. You got, uh, you're the guy that would that appreciate this the most. Um, so back when we were in college, uh, like I said, Todd and I lived together. It was like freshman year. It was like 89, 90. We had a guy. He was the brother of – there's this Russian girl that we knew at school. Her older brother – was like a high roller guy show up in the, the fancy car and the fancy clothes. And we're like, what does he do? He basically tells us, this is what I'm doing. And I want you guys, if you guys want to be in. This was the day, early days of like the, the 1-800 numbers. Call 1-800, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And you could set up those numbers to cost whatever you want, to charge whatever you want per minute. If you, you know, uh, it's like, you know, phone sex, uh, only $1.99 a minute or whatever, but you could make it $100 a minute, $99 a minute. Of course, no one's going to want to pay that. So no one would ever call that number. But what you can do is you set it up to be $99 a minute. Like your first minute is whatever. And then every other minute is $99. Then he would hire two jabronis like me and Todd to go into office buildings dressed like a messenger with a boxer or something under our arm. And say, hey, I've got a package for, you know, John Smallberries. Uh, there's no John Smallberries here. What? Oh, sh- can I call my home office? Yeah, sure. You pick up the phone. You call the one eight hundred number. You hang on the phone for a couple of minutes. You have a fake conversation. You've just charged up about five hundred dollars in call. Hang up. Sorry. Go to the next office right in the same building, and you just work your way down. You could, you know, twenty offices per floor. 30 floors and New York and, you know, the charge gets eaten up and, you know, they don't get the phone bill to who knows. And in the day, you, thousands and thousands of dollars. So we tried it once and we're like, we lost our nerve. And we're like, this is crazy. We're going to get kicked out of college. We're at NYU. We're trying to make movies. Like, this is stupid. But this guy was ready to pay us cash. And he's like, I've got an army of people, can, you know, all over canvassing the city, just making calls to my stupid 1-800 number or whatever. Uh, I was pretty. I thought that was pretty smart. Yeah, I've, the 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 uh, the one nine hundred numbers. That I mean, I've heard a couple of scams uh, like that. You know, okay, yeah. most of them are like calling, you know, to like Jamaica or Haiti or right. you know, and they would charge whatever, and they would they would do it for so many months and build up a credit line with the phone company that gate provided the the line. Right. 
And then at some point when they were so millions of dollars in debt to them, they would close the company down, restart it in somebody else's name, yep. change offices and, and start all over again. It just, you know, so it, it was funny, like the guy that I knew that was in, kind of investigating this whole, what, many of those, he said, like, we knew, like we, we would go and we would look and we're like, he's selling it for 75 cents a minute. We're right. selling him the minutes for 85 cents a minute. He's <laughs> right. like, like, we know it's about to go under. Right. And he, right. But yeah, that's, uh. Yeah, those Back those, are, those are always the big time scams, and then they right. you know, eventually they fall apart. Same thing with the PPP loans. Like these guys are making tons of money, and they're doing great, and they're thinking I'm brilliant. No, it just hasn't caught up to you. Exactly. It it two years it from it later. <laughs> what was your What was your thing? I I I, I know that you had like. Did you have a couple of things, or um... I mean, I had several, but probably the easiest kind of to explain is it was bank fraud. Okay. And, and I had owned a mortgage company and eventually, you know, it was, we were doing fraudulent things in the mortgage company. Eventually I was placed on probation, federal probation for three years. And that's where the, the scam that I'm basically most kind of known for is there's something, do you know what a synthetic identity is? Uh, I think, but you must yeah, It's kind of like a, kind of like a, like a stolen identity, but it's not a real person or it's a, it's okay, a right, combination okay. of fake people. What I did was I went into social security and I figured out how to get social security to issue me social security numbers to children that don't exist. Got so I give them a fake birth certificate, fake shot record. They give me a, a social security number, whatever name I wanted. And then I would buy, go out into a, a, an area, you know, lower middle class area. And I would buy houses for, let's say for the sake of our argument, like $50,000. Mm-hmm. Well, one, I, I got the social security number and I would get secured credit cards. So after paying the minimum payment for six months, they would have 700 credit scores. Right. You only needed a 620 to borrow, uh, to get a loan, a mortgage from the bank. Right. So plus, of course, I've got W-2s, pay stubs. I have all the documents, right? right sure. And so my person, and I had eight or 10 of these guys, I w- we would go out and I would buy a house in their name for $50,000. I would record the sale of that house at 200000 so if you went to public records, it looked like my, right. I just bought a house for 200000 So what happened is you buy enough of those within an area, the whole area starts to go up. Yep. And when the bank, and if you want to borrow money against the house, you want to refinance your mortgage or get a mortgage, you, the bank sends somebody out or you send them an appraisal based on the comparable sales in the area, all of which are mine. Yep. The bank, the bank says, this thing's worth 210 220 right. 240 This whole area is going through the roof. So we would then refinance the house, borrow the money. And so each person borrowed, you know, one mortgage per house, five or six houses in each person. So a $1 million, one and a half million dollars, you'd make 750000 to, you know, 900 a million dollars per person. We would make the payments, of course, you know, for about five or six months, and then we'd stop paying. And then when... Of course, when the, you know, the collection st- started coming in, we would get the letters saying, you know, hey, you're in foreclosure. I would then cut out, an, I cut out an article from the newspaper. This was back when you had newspapers, you know, you cut out the article. Well, we retyped the whole thing where there was like a 17 car pile up on Interstate 4 and someone was life flighted to Tampa General Hi- Hospital and I would insert my guy's name in there and I'd <laughs> highlight it. Right. And I'd write a letter from his sister saying, my brother is in, in a coma. The doctors say, even if he wakes up, he'll never work again. You might as well take the house. And of course, if they if the bank pulled, re-pulled his credit, they would see, well, this guy's got five mortgages and he's got four personal loans and three credit cards or four credit cards. And they're all in default. Like, this is clearly true. If you called his his work, I was his work. You know, we had yep. multiple employers. They would say, I'm sorry, he's no longer here. He's, right. yep, there was an accident. It was checking out. Yeah. Right. And so they just foreclosed on the property and, right. you know, resold it. So I borrowed eleven and a half million dollars in like 18 months or something like that in uh, multiple people's names. A, a friend of mine got caught and uh, he got caught running a scam that was connected to my scam. You know, he wanted right. in on it and something went wrong and he ended up getting caught and they put together a task force. 
which ultimately came after me. And then I went on the run for three years and I continued to commit fraud. Right. So, uh, but the, what you might find interesting. So only since you, you mentioned this person's name is that the names predominantly the names of my borrowers were William blue, James red, um, Michael white, Lee black, right. You know, Brandon Green. So you can imagine how how easy it was when my buddy got arrested. He said, listen, I know somebody who's running a much bigger scam. And he's like, and I can prove it to you right now. Pull up the property appraiser's website for Hillsborough County. Red, five foreclosures. William Blue, seven right. foreclosures. You know, you know, it's like boom, 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 boom. Yeah. And these, this, this guy currently owns four houses. He's about to buy another one. And in six months, they'll all be in foreclosure. Right. So, yeah. 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 Why do I got to be Mr. Pink? Exactly. <laughs> uh, that's so. Let me ask. I, I'm just uh, curious. Like, what made you go from hey, I'm I've got a mortgage company, like it just wasn't profitable enough or whatever. Like, what made you say I'm going to do this this very complicated scam? Um, you know, it what it, it explaining it or it seems complicated right it, to me it's like it's like riding a bike like if you if i explained to you about riding a bike right now you right. would and you'd never ridden a bike it's impossible but once you start riding the bike within a week you're doing wheelies you're jumping ramps you're right you're you know so to me it was very it you know owning that mortgage company so i, I had owned a mortgage company like i said prior to doing that scam mm -hmm. you know i was already periodically changing w-2s or making fake canceled checks. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Okay. So it started as small things. Cause like, it, if you ask me, why did you start riding a bike? It's cause I want to get around and my friends have bikes and you know, right. like there's a reason why you learn, go through that. Like what was the, yeah, the reason behind yeah. it. And you get emboldened by it. Right. You know, every time a loan went through and you close it and you made your little $3,500 broker fee, then that was like, wow, like, like it worked. Right. You know, and the few times that I, uh, it's not even the few times, the many times we got caught, I was able to kind of learn from those experiences because mm -hmm. you'd have an underwriter call up and say, listen, this person's W2 is fake. And you go, what? Right. And they go, yeah. And you say, well, you, you're, are you telling me my borrower gave me a fake W2? How, well, how did you, how'd you find it? And they go, oh, well, turns out that the tax ID number we went on the web. One of the ways we check is we do this and this and this. And I thought next time that needs to match. Exactly. You know? And so, exactly. you know, after three or four years of owning that that mortgage company, I'd I'd learned how to make, although I hadn't really done it at the time, I knew it was possible to make synthetic identities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew it was possible to raise the purchase or to re to record sales in public records at a higher level. Just and you have to pay. The reason people don't do this typically is you have to pay extra doc stamps. If you buy a house for $100,000, you pay about $700 in doc stamps. Mm -hmm. If you just pay the other, another 700,000, I mean, I'm sorry, another $700, it, it shows up at two as a $200,000 sale. Right. So, you know, I, these were just little things that I learned and right. then I was able to manipulate that whole system. And, you know, and then I just made it worse for myself because when I came on, when I, when they came to arrest me. I was tipped off by a sheriff's deputy that was a friend of mine that they were going to come arrest me. The FBI was going to come arrest me. So I, mm -hmm. I took off on the run for three years. You know, I only had a couple of days, so I was only able to leave Tampa with like 80 grand and you're not going to get far on 80 grand. So right. I immediately over the next three years, I borrowed about three and a half to four and a half million dollars running additional more scams, mm -hmm. a little bit more complicated. You know, I've, so I've had, Twenty next year charges. <laughs> what? Yeah, exactly. Just making it worse. Just <laughs> longer. Worse. Yeah. So you know, and I had the worst thing was too is that you know by that point I was able to I figured out how to go into a DMV, get them to give me a driver's license. I was able to get passports. The U.S. the State Department could would issue me passports. Uh, so you know the times that I would get caught running these scams, if I get handcuffed by the police and questioned, they bring me downtown. They question me. I'd convince them I hadn't done anything wrong. They let me go. Right. You know, I like I mean, these are things that happened over and over again. I've numerous 
you know, and then of course it got worse and worse. It was, you know, there were news, tons of newspaper articles. Then I was in fortune magazine. I was in Bloomberg, of course. Uh, date lines running. So, so, you know, it's just, it's like, it's like, I'm thinking, well, this will go away. <laughs> it's not going away. It's getting worse. Every time I turn around, there's another article. So, you know, eventually I end up getting caught and, you know, right. went to prison and. Well, I'm glad you kept it in the financial world and yeah. didn't uh, veer it because, because, you know, there is, you know, like there are guys in our, you know, the cases that we cover that have that sort of like I'm running a scam and then I need to also eliminate a person to, uh, to really, you know, get that insurance money or, you know, whatever. Um, Do you like have our, one of those? Oh yeah. One of our first cases was a guy, he was, he had everything, uh, you know, impersonating people. Uh, his big thing though, it's he, he, um, he became like a pastor and he would, uh, you know, he knew the, the re very religious people were probably the easiest to dupe and he would meet these women and he would come across as, uh, you know, I'm doing all this charity work and all this stuff. And he seemed like the greatest guy. And then he would get all kinds of, you know, five different life insurances on that person. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I don't want to give too much away, but like, you know, came and swept her uh, away from work. Uh, hey, I booked us a, a, an anniversary trip and they'd been married for a, a little while. So it didn't, it wasn't like an immediate thing. I mean, we've had people that kill each other on their honeymoon. And, but this guy, you know, he had waited a bunch of years. Uh, and then one day on their anniversary came to the woman's job, uh, car was packed. Don't worry, we don't have to go home. We're going right on vacation. I packed all your stuff for you. Huge red flag. Uh, if someone packs your stuff for you and won't let you go home and call anybody, probably a red flag. Whisks her away to the uh, Colorado, uh, the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and then, yeah, and then she winds up, you know, off a cliff. And, you know, he swears it was an accident. She fell. She was taking the selfie or whatever. Um, but he had all these life insurances on her. Uh, and then also it turned out his first wife died in the same, not the exact same, but in, in also like was changing a car tire and the jack broke and fell and the car fell on her. And he I also, this has been covered. Yeah. A little bit. This, the way. Yeah. This way. Oh yeah. 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 Um, it just, uh, yeah, this was, this to me was like the quintessential slaycation because this guy, yeah, this guy was great. Uh, in terms of, you know, pure evil and, uh, yeah, his wives and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but you know, again, you you kept it financial, uh, and, and, uh, this guy decided he had to, he had to take lives to, uh, to get what he wanted. Um, you know, I was going to say this, uh, was it, uh, slick Willie Sutton said, you know, they said, why do you rob banks? And he said, well, that's where the money is. <laughs> so exactly. Um, <laughs> gosh, the, the. I was going to say that reminds me of that. Did you ever hear about there were, there were two brothers on, on a Mason company and they would hire like uh homeless people to work as laborers and they would give them a place to live like on, like they had two or three acres or something. They'd give them, put them in a shed. Right. And after they, they get an insurance policy out on them, they'd basically have them drink themselves to death. Yeah. I did hear about that for the insurance. Uh, it yeah. was, yeah, the insurance money is like, I, and there's so many cases like that. So many stories that are, you know, it, it's funny too. A lot of people will go on vacation and, and I think it's part of the going on vacation is I think that they're basically like this person isn't from South America. Right. Like how, how much of an investigation can they do in South America about what's going on here? That, that happens a lot where, yeah, you know, what, what is the local, and, and a lot of times the local, they, they, uh, the local police or whatever, they don't want to make a big deal out of it anyway. They don't want to scare off tourists and make it seem like murders happen here. So they do try to bury a lot of these. Um, there was that famous case, you know, the woman with her friends, uh, Shanquilla Robinson went to uh, Cabo with her friends and, you know, wound up, you know, found in the morning dead after a night of partying. And, you know, the friends said it was, they drank too much or whatever. But then there's a video of her like being beaten up by one of her friends and stuff. And it made national news, but the autopsy, the original autopsies, oh yeah, yeah, they just concurred. Uh, yeah, no big deal because they just didn't want the publicity. But you know, it, it was such a uh, you know a fervor back here in the states. People, and then as new as new evidence would come out, like that, like you know the leaked uh, videotape of the girl being beaten up. It's like, wait, there's more here 
and, and she had like, you know, damage to her face. It's like, that wasn't in the original autopsy. They were like, oh yeah, she must've drank too much. And so, yeah, but a lot of the local authorities don't want the publicity, don't want to make it seem like murders happen here. Um, but we do say, yeah, vacation is the, you know, I, I make the joke. I say, um, if you can't kill somebody on the vacation then you have no business killing people because you just are not cut out for it. I mean, it's, you're doing stuff that you don't ordinarily do. You're in weird position. I mean, you know, you know, you're, you're kayaking, you're hiking, you're on cliffs, you're on mountain trails. There's very few people around. There's always drinking. There's always like nightlife stuff. Now we don't just cover like, so we, we say, you know, uh, we say, you know, if, 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 if a couple, you know, if one murders the other, uh, that's a slaycation. If you go on vacation and you get murdered, We'll also cover that. Uh, there's some interesting cases like that. Couple goes on vacation, meets another couple. They seem like good people. And then after a night of partying, they don't show up to work when on Monday. What happened to them? And, uh, you know, trying to trace those, you know, those last moments and whatever. Was it the couple? Was it something else? Uh, did they just disappear? You know, um, so we, we, say the, we say if you leave for vacation in the plane, and you come home under the plane, then you've been on a, a location. Do you uh, do you ever interview like the uh, the te- detectives, or is this just research? And then you got you kind of ask we, questions. We, yeah, we might get there, but right now it's just uh, it's just they they research the hell out of it, and then I try to probe and ask questions and make off color jokes, and and my wife gets mad at me. Um, so it's a it's a it's a funny dynamic. Um, what I was gonna say. Oh, good. <laughs> no, I was just like I was just gonna say. I was gonna say something like, like I forget what it was last night. Like, like I, two days ago, my wife was just it, it. Something happened, and she looked at me, and she's like, "I am so glad that I married you." She's like, "I mean, she's like, I love you so much. You were such a great guy." And then the next day, we were having a conversation at this desk and i said something that i knew she was going to be like what right. did you say and she i looked up at her and i said something i anyway whatever it was and i looked at her and she goes why am i married to you <laughs> said, wait a minute are you the same person who just i no i believe me i get that i get that a lot too uh i mean it's funny because it's like i'll make sometimes i'll make a joke or i'll have a joke that i'm like i shouldn't say it but i gotta say it so what i'll do is i'll say you know what I was going to say was, and then I'll say the joke as if like I didn't say it, but now I, you know, I, I'm just blurting it out because I was going to, I thought this thing, but it's, it's terrible. And then my wife will just look at me and she's like, you're such an asshole. I know. And it's like, you know, we're recording And She's like, oh yeah, I know. But that, I mean, I think that's part of the fun. And, and, you know, we do bring our marriage dynamic into it and, and, you know, raising our daughter and, um, you know, and it's it's great because you know we've all known each other for over thirty years, so it's like we have a camaraderie that uh, you can't really fake. Um, right. Yeah, we try not to be that podcast that's just laughing at like nonsense and nothing. You know, it's like let's make sure you laugh at something that's actually funny, and let's you know tell the stories. Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, I know you love yeah, you love the little crime thing. Like, I have a story that I think you'll appreciate. It's not a it's not a murder story, but uh, you know, it's a, um, I worked. In a, in a factory in Hackensack, New Jersey, and we made car washes. All the, all the, all the machinery that you'd find in a car wash. Okay. The rubber arms, the curtain, uh, the conveyor that pulls your car. And there was a guy there named Carlos who was the cutter. He would cut all the angles and the flats and the, the beams and the tubes and stuff. And Carlos loved to steal. Uh, this guy was just addicting to stealing the rush of stealing. It didn't even matter what it was. He just loved stealing stuff. I had, I had fucked up my car. So Carlos offered to give me rides to and from work. Uh, in exchange, he would, uh, raid my parents like freezer and like take my dad worked in the meat business. So he would take steaks and, and burgers. He's like, I'll take the little chickens. And I was like, those are capons. He's like, yeah, whatever. And so this guy loved, you know, he loved taking the meat uh in payment for for rides home but the thing was every ride was fraught with danger because he had a little pickup truck and as we're driving he would just pull over and jump out of the car and grab something off someone's lawn bikes a lawn gnome a garden hose whatever he'd just grab it throw it in his truck and just drive off 
And I'd be like, what are you doing? He's like, hey, man, this kid's got to learn. You don't leave your bikes out when Carlos is around. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So at each speed, too, like I was like, at least stop at the red light so you don't get pulled over for that. Anyway, um, there was a, a warehouse across from our factory, and it had a loading dock. And our warehouse did not have a loading dock. So we always had to use their loading dock to put the machinery onto the big uh, tractor trailers to, to ship it. And while we were there, he noticed that the warehouse was open and he could just go right in. And they had like boxes of clothing and stuff. So he would just go in, help himself to a box, run back to our factory. He'd open it up and then he'd try to sell the stuff. Hey, guys, uh, T-shirts, uh, five dollars, three for ten. And the guys were like, you just stole that. <laughs> it's like they would, they would just help themselves to it. But eventually he started taking so many boxes that the warehouse knew something was up. So they, they kept that door closed. Didn't stop Carlos. He'd go in a window, open the window, Carlos in, box out, Carlos out, window closed, off he goes. So then they built a big fence around the warehouse. And they put a dog, a vicious, like, early days of pit bulls, like when, the, you know, the, the most ferocious dog you've ever seen into, you know, inside the fence. And I, you know, snarling, barking. I, I was afraid to eat my lunch outside, even though it was in the fence. Like if it got loose, it would kill you. And I said, I guess it's over, Carlos. And he's looking at the dog and he's just rubbing his chin. He's like, oh, man, it looks like a happy dog to me. Whatever, dude. Needless to say, yeah, they put the dog inside the warehouse when we used the loading dock. And we were terrified. We're like, if this dog gets out, we're dead. I had gotten hired to work on a film shoot for a week or so. So I disappeared, uh, did the film shoot, come back. And when I get to work, Carlos drives up, uh, drives me to work. Uh, I noticed that there's no dog in the yard. And I say to Carlos, I was like, oh, man, did it kill somebody? And he just kind of smiles or whatever. And I'm like, oh, this dog must have ripped somebody apart. Uh, that day, Carlos said, like, hey, you want to ride home? Sure. Get in the car. We're driving. I say, did you forget where I lived? You made a left instead of a right. He goes, I want to show you something. He pulls up in front of his house. He whistles. The dog comes running out of the house. He stole the dog. I was going to say, I knew he I knew he he stole the dog. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I was just like. Yeah, hats off to Carlos, wherever he is, uh, whatever prison he's in now. Or maybe not. I don't know. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I've always been fascinated by stories about crime. Uh, and then, you know, these these stories were just uh, the slication stories are just so, I mean, I, I don't want to use the word fun because there's, you know, people, you know, are getting killed. But they're so tricky and convoluted and twisty and turny. Um, you, you really won't know until the very end was it an accident or was it murder. And uh, even even at the end, you're like, I don't know, there's still something there. And sometimes the people are caught, and sometimes they let go. How how many episodes uh, do do you have per season? Well, we just um, you know we just started. Like we haven't even figured out what a season is. We've recorded eleven so far. We're launching. Uh, the idea is to record two two a month. Uh, and just stay ahead of our schedule. And, right. you know, uh, it's, it's interesting because our, with our kids' educational podcast, we never did a season. We just keep going. We have 500. Yeah, okay. I think yeah. with this, we'll probably, you know, maybe 20-something episodes and we'll call that a season, um, you know. Well, I mean, I guess now you don't really have to have a season. I was thinking more yeah. kind of TV-ish kind yeah. of. Um, well, and, and it depends typically when you go to – a production company like they they typically buy a certain or fund a certain amount right so they'll be like okay your season's 12 or four we need 14 of these or um are, are you concerned about there being an end i mean l listen how many high profile like it's got to be high profile enough for you guys to be able to find them right i mean that that's how we started we you know because i i said the first one I was like, man, it's location. And, and then we got excited. And then it's like, okay, let's see if we can find 50 or more, then there's probably something. We found right. over well over 100. Oh, okay. So, you know, uh, they're not all going to be super twisty and turny sometimes, uh, but they all have something. Yeah, we, we, you know, uh, they, they all have something that's going to suck you in and, uh, you know, um, We've even done a couple that are like two-parters. 
because there's so much, you know, going you think on. it's going one way and then all of a sudden a new piece of evidence. And it's like, oh my God, we can talk another hour about this. It's like, all right, then we will. We'll do. They, they surprised me with one the other day. There was like, um, Jerry started recapping. I'm like, why are we recapping? I know where we are. He's like, because you think you know where we are, but we're right. going to do the rest in part two. I was like, oh shit, people have been talking for you know, 50 minutes. Um, like, okay. So we did, yeah, we did a two parter on, uh, on a case. Yeah, I was. Gonna, I, I interviewed um, a couple of actually they were they're actresses that t- are turned podcasters, and they do a podcast called uh, "I Met My Murderer Online." Mm. Yeah, and, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. The problem is, is like because they're co- basically going off of people that met like on dating apps, right? Like, I just like how many are there? Yeah, that might be f- a little bit more finite. Um, yeah. Well, that, so. yeah, that's why I said, yeah, we, we, we cover people that murder each other on the on vacation or if you get murdered. And then the white whale, if you go on vacation and then see a crime of opportunity and actually murder somebody else and then leave because you're like, hey, I'm in a foreign country. I, I can probably get away with it. Yeah. Uh, well, what's the guy that murdered? Oh, gosh, the girl Holloway. Oh, Natalie Holloway. Yeah. Natalie Vander, Holloway. Vander Sloot. Uh, so we haven't even done that one yet. That oh, okay. could be like a three-parter, you know, it's like, but it's so known that we've kind of avoided it's, 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 but there's new revelations. So, I mean, it is, but you know, here's the problem is like, I've always heard bits and pieces, bits and pieces. Mm-hmm. Right. And now it's come out to the, to where he's basically, hasn't he basically admitted it? And been, yeah. No, so, there's actual closure on it uh, after years of, of nothing. So. Yeah. Right. So, so now you could probably do an episode, even if it was just one episode on the highlights of it, because yeah. like, I don't know the whole, I, I know bits and pieces and I'm sure that's a sick guy. Like uh, yeah. he's, I mean, the, the fact is, is like, <laughs> I don't want to say this, like murdering one person. It's almost like, okay, murdering one person. Okay. But murdering, but then he murders another person, you know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? So but yeah, he clearly is just a, a serial killer that maybe right. only got to, you know, maybe only got to two. He may, there may be other people out there who knows, but right. this is like, you already know the scrutiny you're under. Right. Well, like you said, you do the one thing, you get away with it and you, you think, become a oh, right. you know, and then you're like the polar bear that got a taste for it. And you're like, I can, I can do it again. Um, in fact, he's probably thinking like, I'm the last person they would think. Right. I mean, I, you know, after everything I've been to, that guy would never murder somebody. Look at all the scrutiny and look, you know, I, I don't know. But we definitely will cover Natalie Holloway. We've, I think, we avoided it because it was so known. Um, you know, like there are cases that we do that are, are no. And, and look, we just discovered there was a Lifetime movie uh, made on one of our cases um, about a guy who took his uh, fiance or actually uh, they, they had just got married. Honeymoon, Great Barrier Reef. He's uh, Mr. Pro Scuba Diver, and she's never scuba dived, and she's terrified. And he won't even let her take the lessons. Like, no, 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 I've got it, I've got it. And they lied in their interviews so that she would just be able to scuba dive without even getting the lesson. Is it just uh, a guy who's got murder on his mind, or is he just this alpha male asshole who's like, I, I can, I can teach better than they can. Trust me, just right. be with me. Well, they go down there. She starts to panic, and uh, he's trying to fix her breathing apparatus. is not working something, blah, blah, blah. And suddenly she starts to sink, and he gets panicky, and he goes up to the surface. And then she's found dead, and uh, they, they try to rescue her, but she's, she's already gone. Then it comes out like, oh, some other diver thought he saw them struggling, and he thought he saw him pulling at her, at her uh, you know, respirators, you know, and then it, so then that came out, but then something else came out that like the respirator makes a noise or something if it's, and it didn't make, you know, so there's like little weird evidence that, that swings it back and forth like a pendulum, like, oh, he's guilty. Oh, wait, maybe not, you know? Uh, oh yeah. Cause he had claimed that something was wrong with his thing. And then they tried to say like, well, that would never happen, but then they proved that that can happen and that it did happen. So it's like, you just never, you never quite know. Uh, and then he escaped. He got back to the States and then Australia wanted him like, to, you know, but they don't have an extradition treaty or whatever. They weren't going to send him back, but then he went back on his own. Uh, yeah. So they, you know, these cases are convoluted and uh, they're really cool. And 
as far as true crime goes. <laughs> You know? I was going to say, there's one, I was thinking about one that it's not, a, I don't, th- it's not a murder because it was a, I think it was a couple that went out like scuba diving and they were left by the boat. Like oh. they got too far away and they just got left and they just said, okay, they got eaten by sharks. Like, is that the, is that the uh, open water? That yeah. They made a movie. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's just horrible. Horrible. I mean, yeah. I like shark movies. So of course oh. I saw that one. Yeah, uh, they 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 counted wrong, and uh, they thought they were they, they counted somebody twice or something like that, and then they left them there. Um, yeah, but uh, that could be on our show because it they definitely died on a vacation. So we that that fits under the vacation umbrella. Like I said, if you leave in the plane and come home under the plane, if you pack a bag and come home in a bag, it's just like that. You're good. You're good. You yeah, good for you. Right. Um, <laughs> I was gonna say it's horrible. I know, uh, I know, I know. What kind of karma am I building up with this? Yeah, I was gonna say this is gonna come. This is one of those things you're gonna have to answer to, right? <laughs> answer for, sorry. You know, it's funny because I say all the time, like my wife is so. You know, she's got the best voice of the three of us. She's the one that sounds like a podcaster, uh, and she, you know, her whole thing is like she's doing true crime. She just wants to understand the human psyche and how are people capable of doing. So- this is this is that, and this is part of the women thing. Like they want to know, they want to know: can these people be fixed? Uh, what is it? What do I look for? Uh, why, you know, how have I gotten away? You know, I'm lucky that it wasn't me, but it could have been me. Blah blah blah. So she's coming from that angle. I'm like, people are going to love you, Jerry. He does research and he's very empathetic, and he almost like doesn't like the true crime genre, but he he understands that like some of these stories need to be told, and he wants to you know champion the victims and, and you know whatever. So I said, people will like or be neutral on him. And then they got me and I'm like, I'll, I'm the asshole that people, yeah. agree. they'll either like, they'll, they'll think I'm funny or they'll be like, this guy's an asshole. But Listen, you know I, I, that's the, I'd rather play that part. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Don't rage. Yeah. Listen, just to fucking yell at me. So, but you know, listen, people, she's never going to understand the human psyche. I can tell you right now, I was in prison for 13 years and people are just horrific. They're just right. horrible. We're, we're a horrible species. We really are. Right. Right. If we went away and the animals just took over, it'd be probably better. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching. Do me a favor. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell so you get notified of videos just like this. Leave me a comment and I will try and respond. Also, if you want to check out Slaycation, please check the description box. And I really appreciate it. Please consider joining my Patreon. Thank you very much. See ya.